This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of July 15th, 2020. Based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL chapter 30A, section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12, 2020, this planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Christine graham Allen, and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 634. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken as normal. I will now take a roll call. Board members, as you hear your name called, unmute yourself and answer affirmatively, and then please place yourself back on mute. Michael Burtwistle. Michael? <laughs> Present. Great. And Maria Chow? Present. <laughs> and Jack Jemsek? Present. And David Levenstein? Here. And Doug Marshall? Present. And Janet McGowan. Here. Board members, if technical difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily to rectify the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let Pam or Sean know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note the disconnection has occurred. Please zoom. Oh, okay. Uh, please use the hand, uh, raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and I will call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to uh, please remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and other appropriate times throughout the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during the any of the public comment periods, you must join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide and can be entered into a search engine. The link can also be found on the meeting agenda, which is located, um, located on the town website in two places. One way is through the calendar listing for which this meeting um, is listed on the homepage, and then you click on the link for event details. A second way is to go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda. Um, and on that agenda, you'll see the link at the top of the page, virtual meeting. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called upon, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If these guidelines are not complied with or the speaker exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Included on tonight's agenda, item three, public hearing, site plan review, the board will continue the public hearing for Amherst Media's SPR application to construct a new home office building, uh, which began on at the July 1st. 2020 meeting. Moving on, the slide will now show the meeting agenda. There, great. And again, note the virtual meeting, Zoom meeting link at the top. Item one, minutes. We do have a set of minutes that came in our packet for June 10th, 2020. If we all have them and if we've all reviewed them, and I need to pop up my um, screen here. Okay, so are there any comments or anyone, uh, any of the planning board members uh, either want a correction or um, make comments or something, or do I hear a motion? Move, move to approve the minutes of June 10th. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay, again, are there any comments, discussion, uh, corrections that need to be made on these minutes? Uh, Doug, your hand is up. Was that your second? Or should I put? Okay. Um, so at that, at this point, we can um, take a vote on the minutes, and I will roll call if all are ready. Um, and this is for again the June tenth planning board minutes. Michael Bartwhistle. Yes. Maria Chow. Yes. Jack Jemsek. Yes. David Levenstein. Approve. <laughs> Doug Marshall. 
approve. Janet McGowan. Yes. And I, Christine Graham-Mullen, also approve these minutes. So that's 700, great. Um, at this time, we're going to move ahead to item <coughs> um, here um, public comment ham uh, yes would could, you like to see the agenda can you I don't think I have co-host capabilities right now oh if you so could just sorry. adjust that thing <laughs> no worries no I just was gonna adjust things and I'm like I have no adjusting um, thanks so uh, at this point we have public comment period item two this is where we open it up I'll check um, attendees raise your hand if you have a public comment but I must stress that it's not for anything that's on our agenda tonight so if you have a comment wait for that item but you have something totally different that you would like to speak on I will now um, check to see if there's any hands Pam did you see any and is there anything on the phone I don't see any hands raised. I don't see any phone calls in. Um, you were asking earlier if Mr. Reedy was here. I do see Mr. Reedy in the attendees. Okay, great. So that will be, okay. So at this point, what time did we have it? Oh yeah, we're good. Um, okay, so uh, since it is 640, we can start, uh, continue our uh, SPR for Amherst Media, and I will... I'm going to move some people in, Christine. Okay, great. Move Bucky in. Let's start there and see. He, there's some other people who may want moved in. If any of the Amherst Media people, the applicants, um, mm -hmm. are going to speak, uh, you can raise your hand and then Pam can move you over and then I will um, get you all and, and call you. So, okay. So in accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 48, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2020-11, Amherst Community Television, DBA Amherst Media, corner of Gray Street and Main Street continued from July 1st, 2020. Request site plan review approval to construct a new building and associated site improvements for Amherst Media, a 501c3 educational institution under section 3.330.0 of the zoning bylaw. BL zoning district map 14B parcels 250 and 251. Okay, uh, so at this point, uh, raise your hand if there's any board disclosures. And I'm not seeing any. Um, so usually we move to the applicant's presentation. I first just want to check in with Chris Bestrup if she has anything to say at this time or should we move to um, the applicant or their representative. I think it's fine if you move to the applicant. Um, I just wanted to note that the applicant has submitted a special permit application for modification of the front yard setback and probably the applicant will speak about that. Okay, and you can answer questions about that after. Yes. Great, thank you. So at this time, I will welcome um, Bucky Sparkle. You are here, can you speak? And I hear you got a new mic. Oh, you noticed. Wow. It was worth the investment right there. Thank you. There was a rumor you had got a new one. So good. Great. You also have a different tarp in the back. So a little in one different place. I felt a little crowded before. I'm still in that unfinished basement <laughs> office that you're going to see for the next year or so if I have to keep doing these by Zoom. So you can always put a fake background like Jack has beautiful flowers tonight. They're awesome. I also find them distracting and if I get animated then it gets weird. <laughs> That's true, the dancing flowers and yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, well welcome. Thank you. Um, so what we got this week is we and the before I think it came in an email. Uh, we have a letter from you dated uh, well you're replying to the June 29th letter and it was to Jason Skeels, the town engineer, responding to some of his comments. So uh, you, of course, can bring any other information you have for us, but mm -hmm. that's one of the things we're expecting you to talk on. That is certainly on the list. I will get to that. Um, and I think it's probably best if I just jump to the screen sharing portion. Is that all right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I 
Pam, he's all. Are you? Yes. Okay. You should have all the capabilities. How's that? Beautiful. Okay. Great. Um, so I had two points of good news. One is I do have a new, mic new microphone, and two, I have a much shorter presentation this evening. Um, so let me just roll into that. Um, as stated previously, my name is Bucky Sparkle. I'm the civil engineer for the project, and I am here representing Amherst Media. There are uh, a few of their board members who are probably in the waiting gallery this evening who may uh, choose to speak. Um, hopefully, if um, they'd raise their hand, you'll be able to let me know because I don't think I mm -hmm. see that. Um, also, of course, we, I believe we have representatives of Gillen Collaborative Architects around who, of course, designed the building. Um, as stated, this is a continuation of the meeting from two weeks ago. And what happened at the last, uh, several things happened at the last meeting, but some comments from the planning board that I recall came to mind were that, you know, understandably as a property owner that there is a right to lawfully build upon their property, uh, that the couple of waivers that we're looking for uh, were fairly reasonable and understandable uh, for the reasons that we have uh, to ask, and that the project and the building is, is a much better fit for the site, particularly compared with what we did um, in 2019. Uh, there were a couple of requests from the board as well, uh, one is we wanted to see the location of the trash and recycle bins. We'll get to that. And more detail on the wall, the retaining wall, the north end, and the stormwater system. So uh, also, this is something that I'm going to get into a little bit more. And as brought up by um, our chair this evening, and Chris Bressart mentioned that we have uh, submitted a special permit for, um, I guess, relief from bylaw section 6.60 which would normally double the front setback, well, all setbacks for religious and educational uses. Um, and there will be a public hearing for this. So I'm, I'm happy to get into it more this evening, uh, but I, I'm also happy to let that be an aside. It's something that we just keep in mind, we are seeking, um, and eventually it's gonna dovetail very much with this and I'm gonna I'm going to take the responsibility for not catching this in our initial application because I really would have made an application for that special permit with the site plan plan review application, which would have made this a little less confusing. Um, so, but we can talk about that more um, as the board sees fit. Um, we have made a few modifications um, since we were here last uh, to the plans, to the landscaping, to the parking, stormwater, and the wall. And what I'm gonna do then is just walk the board through these items, um, not in text form. So looking at some pictures, uh, we're gonna look at the site plan and I'm gonna zoom in again a little bit. Uh, some things that have changed here. So we have located the trash and recycle bins. They are now in the Northwest corner of the building. There is a fence that runs um, on the north and west side here. We also have the HVAC compressors over here. So it's still conveniently located. There's a gate now uh, for a fence right here. So those will be obfuscated along with the mechanical equipment. So we won't have to look at that when we're walking in. Uh, I also made note that, um, although I guess it's on the, the drainage and utility plan, that uh, a Knox box and strobe light for the fire department, that's indicated on the plan. Um, on a slightly different sheet than the one I'm showing you now, but that's at the front door. And uh, I have also uh, corrected setbacks. So now I read the setbacks off of the main table. I did not catch um, some subsections later where the setback against the residential, so we have residential to the north and to the west, yet this is the a BN zoning, neighborhood business. So it's a 20 foot setback on the north and a 20 foot setback on the west, not a 10 foot, as would be standard for the BN in all directions. Um, I have left the 10 foot setback at the front. Um, this is the point of discussion regarding the special permit from section 6.60. Uh, Rob Mora's opinion was that the setback as shown is appropriate for this case, as he wrote in his email that came at the right before the last meeting. So I don't think anybody had a chance to read it then. I, that board members have had a chance to read it in the last two weeks. 
Um, so I'm, I'm going with Rob's opinion and showing that setback now. Um, I did make, uh, because there was a comment about parking, and even though uh, for these parallel parking spaces near the wall uh, that a resident had made, uh, I had extra wide spaces to try and create more more room between the wall and, the, and where the cars would be. And I realized after that public comment that it's probably better to have a regular size space and have more green space between the pavement and the wall. So we've increased the space here. So there is now a couple of feet from the edge of the pavement to the wall. So we have something like three feet, three and a half feet from the side of a car to the wall, which is plenty of room to get in and out of a car. It's the same amount of room they had before, it just will look uh, and feel like there's more room there. And those are changes to the plan and the parking. Uh, I'm gonna bring up the landscape plan here. And uh, I can drag this up a little bit. So there are a few things that have changed on the landscape plan. Oh, there's a little note. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a note that says add plantings with a question mark. Y yes, the answer is yes to that. And we have actually added a screening section on the southern and eastern sides of these two parking areas and borrowing a page from the UMass and Amherst pollinator requirements or suggestions uh, that this embankment here of green will uh, is selected exclusively from the UMass recommended pollinator list. So if I uh, move down the screen a little bit, the, the species list has been expanded uh, if we want to get into anything individually, we can look at it, but uh, we've added several plants down here that would be going in and um, they're all pollinator friendly. We have also added, as was a suggestion uh, by Berkshire Design Group, and a fair one of course, is um, the sizing of the plants for when they're initially uh, installed as well as the spacing of the plants for when they're initially installed, installed in these beds. So uh, the landscape designer provided that information to me since the last uh, meeting. And also this tree, this elm tree that's labeled as uh, planting V, like Victor. Uh, I, I heard a comment actually from Chris Bressrup that it was a bit close to the 25 foot triangles, uh, site triangle. So I created that triangle on this plan so you could see how it lays out and the tree was actually outside of that, but what, at least the trunk. So what I, I moved it further away anyway. So it's, it's even further away from the site triangle and it still doesn't interfere with our stormwater system in this location. So that seemed, seemed appropriate. Um, other things that the board was interested uh, would be the stormwater. So I have made a few changes to the stormwater plan. Well, I say a few, I've made very few changes to the stormwater plan. Mostly this was Jason Skill's recommendation in his letter. And so here's where uh, you brought up my reply to Jason. He had a few comments. He said, show the drain that comes from the wall. So that drain is now uh, illustrated and um, make a note about this sign to remove and replace the, the stop sign. It's also the sign which bears the Gray Street name. Uh, actually, I think I had that note on a, on a different plan that maybe Jason didn't see, but I just put it on the utility plan as well. Uh, and really the biggest thing, that the, the real change that he wanted was uh, a belt and suspenders approach to doing the best possible effort in making sure that water that's coming from uh, the, the mansions up the hill and uh, Newell Court, because there's water that drains from Newell Court across Amherst Media's property, that's 2.2 acres of, of land that is unmitigated. And while we are capturing a, a portion of that and bringing it into our stormwater system, uh, we're going to add a curtain drain that runs along the back of the granite curb here and tie that into our catch basin. And the main reason for that is Jason Skeels indicated that at one point he saw water bubbling up um, at the corner. I'm going to I don't know if you can see my hands, but at the corner of the, the granite curb and the sidewalk, that water was coming up between that joint, between the curb and the sidewalk. So that simply uh, eliminating, redirecting surface water may not be enough to eliminate the icing problem, 
So he asked that we install a, a drain that is right up against the back of that curb. So that's what we've done. We've installed a, a cutoff drain here that's tied to the catch basin. Uh, so that is the, the change to the stormwater system and uh, what Jason felt was appropriate for this site. Otherwise, uh, he's totally into the stormwater design. It seems to work for him. Um, and I do wanna talk about the last thing is the retaining wall. So this wall that runs along the back of the property, <clears throat> um, there were a few questions that were brought up not only by Berkshire Design Group, uh, but board members as well wanted to see more information. So what I've done is I've created a plan that'll bring up in a second. And it's as if you were standing in the parking lot and you were looking north at the face of the wall. So this is that plan, uh, sliding this into position a little bit. And it's scaled five to one. So uh, it is scaled five times higher than it is wide. So the reality is this wall is proportionally not this tall. Um, another thing that, it, just because of the, the scales, five to one. Um, another thing to point out is that we adjusted the grade what we had done before was we built the wall to the existing grade and just we're going to leave the existing grade behind the wall. Uh, but there were some comments about the wall height and we thought it might be possible to get this wall under four feet tall. So what we have done and maybe looking at the profile here a little bit, let me zoom in with this guy. If you were, well, if you were to, mm, I know this is going to zoom in. Let me go back. Sorry, I'm misusing my machine here. Um, so zooming back to this, right? So the highest point of the wall is at the west end of the parking lot. And it's 3.9 feet of exposed wall face at this point in time. We, we've been able to lower it down. And one of the ways we've done that, now I'm going to zoom into the profile, is this is the highest point of the wall. So. Over on this side, this is looking west. So this would be the grass in front of the wall, the face of the wall that rises 3.9 feet, uh, the width of the wall. And then we're, we're, the existing grade used to come relatively level and we were building the wall up to that height, but we have a, a couple of feet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a, a slope that is still maintainable, uh, but lowers the face of the wall. And so now we're gonna have a cut slope up to the property line. And there were questions also about, well, how do we manage, um, you know, the, the excavation and working that close to the property line and the uh, information on, on the dead men, et cetera. So I went back and, you know, now that the wall height changed, I ran through the numbers again. And this wall is a gravity wall. It does not require any dead man, any geogrid reinforcing, any tie backs. It will stand up just fine on its own and hold up this four foot embankment. Uh, at, at the highest, it's 3.9 feet. <clears throat> we are still including dead men as just one additional factor of safety there. They're very easy to install once you've got all of this open and uh, we, we don't see any harm in adding an additional factor of safety here. Uh, in talking with the contractor and looking at excavation safety, uh, when we do get to this higher uh, wall section, uh, they're prepared to bring in steel plating to shore up the embankment. Um, and that will be stabilized on site such that the workers will be able to build the wall. It will likely reveal this cut slope in section so they're not going to just open up the entire hillside and leave it open while they slowly build this wall. They're going to do it in sections as, as they can. And um, that is going to also increase the, the safety and stability. Uh, you can open up a cut, a trench, and it's fine for hours, sometimes days, sometimes months, but eventually things start to, to, to crumble out down on you. So we're gonna keep it open for a, the minimum amount of time necessary to build the wall and then, and then move on. Um, and I, I think that's the main points I have about the wall, uh, as well as the main new information from the last meeting. Um, I do have uh, and, and want to just very briefly go through uh, the remaining brief slides here, just to refresh people's memory. Um, we do have the, 
architectural elevation of the facade that faces Main Street still available to review. This one's been colored up a little bit. Uh, we still have the elevations. This is unchanged from the original submittal of all sides of the building. Um, I still have a floor plan that we can look at if you're interested. I have the information on the lighting we can look at if you're interested. I have the information on the signs we can look at if you're interested. Um, and in getting down to the bottom here, uh, it, just reiterating, we are seeking, this is the formal part, I guess, we are seeking waivers from bylaw 7.004. Uh, we are, uh, we only need at most five parking spaces. We're proposing eight. Uh, the bylaw says, you know, mathematically 15 is the correct amount. So we're seeking a waiver there. Um, we discussed that at, at length at the last meeting. I can talk more about it um, as well as bylaw 7.103 uh, and putting a vehicle parking space within eight feet of the building or a driveway within five feet of the building. We're using fire retardant materials and the fire chiefs or the fire safety officer, Mike Roy said that would meet his requirements. Um, as well as, since this is such a, a low traffic generating facility, uh, roughly generating the amount of traffic of one and a half residences that the uh, traffic study or, or a big report is also being requested as a waiver. It's, it's an awful lot of work uh, for very little traffic and traffic that doesn't even go past a single driveway on Gray Street turning in from Main Street. Amherst Media is the first driveway. And only because it came up um, across my desk at about 5 p.m. today, and it brought up several points that I expect will be heard um, in the public comment, um, I do want to talk about a couple points brought up by Attorney Matt Massengill's letter. Um, and on a, I don't know if anybody's had a chance to read it, because it just showed up. Uh, Some of us, I'm sure, did. I okay. Had time. All right. Um, so first of all, on, on a personal note, what I'm going to say is I'm sorry that the playing board is, is you know, subjected to vitriol might be too strong of a word. Um, I, I do don't believe that the playing board has been uh, criticizing the neighbors and abutters. And I really do believe you're doing your job the way you need to be doing it. Um, so I, I don't think it's fair. Some of the things that were stated in that letter. Um, but, but returning to the more professional point, I'm not going to talk about the majority of the things that Attorney Massengill brought up. Um, my opinion is that there were a lot of things that were erroneous, propaganda-ish. Um, but I do want to talk about a few things that he did bring up that, that does pertain to this application. Um, he did indicate that the local historic district commission just gave up and approved this project after being browbeat, apparently, those are my words, um, by Amherst Media's attorney and high power architects. Um, the Historic District Commission unanimously voted to approve this and then further went on to issue a two page letter of support for this project. So to me, that does not seem like the district commission just gave up um, on this issue. There was also talk in that letter about um, takings versus easements and raise questions about that. There, there is no question about that. The easement was agreed upon. It is an easement to be provided upon approval of the site plan review and it does not affect the setback because I know setback is an issue that um, is being pushed around a little bit. That's why we're coming up for a special permit. Um, but we, we know that it's not a taking. We know that we're gonna give the town a 10 foot wide easement to maintain the sidewalk. Um, and uh, there was an entire paragraph about how I have been misrepresenting uh, aspects to the planning board and that I received a letter from Rob Mora. It is true, I did not receive a letter from Rob Mora. I received a copy of an email from Rob Mora and I guess maybe in the legal world, there's a big difference between letter and email. I tend to use these words interchangeably. So I do apologize for that confusion. Um, and no, that letter was not written to me. It was written to Chris Bressrup. Um, I just received a copy of it because it's the project that I'm presenting. Um, and Attorney Massengill spends quite a bit of time about talking about what Amherst Media wants and thinks, even though he's not been present at any of the board meetings, to my knowledge. Um, 
of all of the things that he said, I don't need to address most of it, but I do want to say that the uh, project and site design that we have submitted is very much desired by Amherst Media. We don't want to change anything. This is exactly what we want to do. Um, and that apparently is not how Matt is, is twisting the situation. So uh, those are things that I just wanted to put on the table uh, for clarification purposes. And I think I've already given too much time to, to that three page letter. So at this point, I'm going to return to the site plan view, maybe with here and I'll relinquish screen sharing if that's preferred, and I'm open to board comments, questions, and the rest of our process. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, if you don't mind leaving your shared screen up because uh, these, these slides might be helpful. Um, so at this time, I'll open it up. Well, I, I'm gonna just, Chris, do you, Chris, uh, Chris Fester, do you have anything you want to add to this or comment, or do you have a question? Not at this time. Thank okay, you. so I'm going to open it up to the board members for questions to Mr. Sparkle at this point. Um, if they have any questions about the um, stuff that was addressed, um, I'm not seeing any hands. I have one question. Um, so at this point, you don't have a parking management plan. Um, our the narrative that we submitted did include a parking management plan. Uh, we haven't actually seen one, but um, I guess I just wanted to put a point that I think should be in the parking management plan. Um, you know, I'm hearing in some of the comments and concerns is, you know, it's a fairly small parking lot and you've done a lot of work showing uh, radius turns for uh, um, different size automobiles. Um, and I just want to say, you've also been very clear that, um, you know, 80% of the time or most business days that there's only one or two employees, maybe three. So my thinking was it would be comforting to see in that plan that there, the staff is expected or encouraged or to park on the inner spots that are a little more difficult to get in and out of. Not impossible, obviously, but for a newcomer who comes, it is a little bit more challenging. And we all know that, you know, even our own driveways after you've been getting in and out of them over a few weeks or get through that snowstorm or whatever, you kind of learn the tricks of how to get your car in and out of there. And then that would leave maybe spot, I think it's seven and eight, it doesn't say it on this drawing, but they're the two down by the sidewalk. Yeah, uh, there's seven, seven and eight. eight. Maybe could those be labeled as guest parking spaces? So they're more available for people who are that coming in to do a recording or TV show or something like that. And had any thoughts or discussion, you know, this may be more, you know, partly you, but partly Amherst Media and their function. But um, that might be helpful to have that spelled out. I think that's a very reasonable consideration. I'm sure my client would have no difficulty installing a couple of attractive signs indicating guest parking. It's the first parking right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so now I see three hands. Uh, I'll call on David and then we have, uh, oh, so I'm gonna backtrack on that. Chris, I do see your hand up. So if Chris, if you want to make a comment, then I'll go to David and then Janet, though David just disappeared. But Chris. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that there was a parking management plan. Um, I went back and reread um, Mr. Sparkle's project narrative and the parking management plan is embedded in the parking manage in the project narrative. So um, he could embellish on that and present it as a separate document if the planning board would like that to be so. No problem. That, yeah, great. Yes, I do see some of that in there, but if it could just be an actual parking management plan. I'll isolate that and we'll, we'll talk about the modifications since the original narrative submittal. Great. Thank you. Um, so David's hand, I'm going to go back to calling on David and then Janet. Hi, thanks. Um, Bucky, can you, 
Yeah. Can, can you sh walk us through the floor plan? I don't recall you doing that, and I'm curious about about it and about sure. the, yeah. both floors. And then, then the other thing is, I hadn't noticed the sign in the northeast corner. Um, and then, so if, if if you could take a minute or two, just to to draw to a, a clearer picture for me of that too. Absolutely, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I guess anytime I talk about architectural floor plans, I should say I'm not the architect, um, but I am familiar and we do have the drawing up here. And I would invite, um, if we have John Krifka mm -hmm. in the side, if he would like to speak at any point to allow him to, to butt in, I'm not sure the best way to do that through Zoom. Chris so, can move um, him over, hold on one sec. I also see I'm gonna do that. Eric Wilkinson, Sam, is he someone tied to the architect or anything? Or do we know who that He's is? He's not on my list. No, okay. I, I don't, that name's so not familiar. It, I'm just gonna say to attendees, uh, if you are part of public comment, if you could lower your hand at this point, um, and we will have a public comment period and um, you'll have a, a time to speak then, but, um, so I am gonna move down that, lower that hand for right now. Um, and if there's anyone on Amherst Media or the architect who would like to add comment, are we sure Eric Wilkerson, he just put his hand up again. <laughs> okay, let's ask him. <laughs> oh, whoops. Nope, he put his hand on, okay. So All anyways, right. if I'm watching for hands and Pam is too, for anyone who is tied to Mr. Sparkle's presentation or the applicant, um, Amherst Media, to raise your hand. Okay, um, so back to you, Mr. Sparkle, thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, the, the floor plan, I guess I'll just literally walk through. So if you were to park in the parking lot, um, there is a, an entryway from the parking lot, which is gonna be the way most people who drive arrive. Most people who come by bus and uh, bike, well, I guess the bike rack is back here. So cars and bikes will come in this entrance. Pedestrians and bus riders will come in this entrance. And this uh, area through here includes a reception desk and uh, a lobby area, sort of a, a meet and greet uh, space, as I understand it. Um, the the heart of this place is really a you know a, a TV studio here. So if you were to go down the hallway, their primary studio, their larger studio, uh, is under um, this is where the roof is is highest uh, to facilitate the studios. So they have the studio here. They have a control room that obviously is technically connected to the main studio as well as a smaller studio. So they do I think small interviews and and uh, things that don't require very much space within the small studio. They do have a few offices, um, office here, a programmer's office, uh, another one down here on Main Street, the director's office. Uh, so there's definitely office space available um, in three stations, uh, a little bit of storage. Uh, there's a green room as well. So, you know, if you're about to go on TV or a public Zoom meeting, sometimes it's nice to chill out right before that. Uh, they have a computer workstation, and I, there's a lot of media is done digitally, so the a computer station is is part of that. And I'm also certain that this is very much part of their educational component, as they're they're teaching students how to use some of these softwares, how to use this equipment. So this is sort of the educational component of what they do. Bathrooms, of course, uh, a little small conference room. Um, they don't need a lot of space for that. A break room. Uh, equipment storage, and then this is the mechanicals for the, the you know, meters, and it says cable casting and some other, I don't even know what cable casting is, I have to admit. Um, it, it sounds like TV stuff to me. Um, now, I don't have a copy of the uh, second floor floor plan because it is just storage. Um, and Let's see if I can trick my computer into doing something useful here. As I understand it, so uh, because of the gabled roof, a good deal of the space is too low to be useful. And because of fire laws, I don't think they even get to use the entire attic without, um, there, it has to be within a certain distance of an egress on the ground floor. So something like this is storage above the building. So there are stairs up and that this blue area that I've created is 
roughly the place where a human being can stand up. So that's where they're going to, they have quite a bit of equipment and sets and other things that they're, they're moving around and, and storage space is a fairly important component of their operations. So uh, they have as much of it as they, they can use. Um, and, uh, but that floor plan is very simple. It stairs up to a storage space and that's it. Um, I'm going to delete that gray area. So, um, David, you asked a question that is thumbs up. All right. Now going over to the sign, let's we'll look at this a couple of ways. First, oh, let me go look at the whole page here. Um, this is the main street view. So the first thing I'll point out is that the driveway is in front of the sign and the sign Gray Street is over on this side and the sign will look something like that. As far as location on the plan, let me go up to the more simple site plan itself. The sign is located right here on the north side of the driveway entrance. And then for further detail for the the pretty stuff, the architect has provided uh, information on what the sign would uh, what the sign would look like. And here is a, a hand sketch of detailing that the sign is going to be, you know, a, a it's, you know, it's a sort of a concrete masonry core, but upon which they will apply um, Goshen stone. So the, that veneer will match the retaining walls in the vicinity. So they're trying to get all the walls in the sign to, to relate to one another aesthetically. Um, it w is cut back a little bit. So the middle part of the sign, if you look at this profile, is further back than the face of the sign. So that the Goshen stone is in front. It's just a slate background. And there are pin letters that go in front of it. It does have illumination and that, so there's this capstone, this two foot wide capstone that is uh, another slate slab and there'll be a shielded LED light bar. So it's shielded on three sides and it directs light just straight down so that the face of the sign is illuminated and legible. Um, the end of the uh, sign itself will look like a rectangle of stone. The back of it will look like a wider rectangle of stone. If you look at it from the top, here's like another cut section so that there's this Goshen stone edifice that wraps around it, the structural core, the aesthetic, you know, letters and logo, and then the light bar that faces downward. Is, is that information that you were seeking, David? Thanks, that was great. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, part of my, I think it's great. It's a beautiful looking sign, although I think it's going to get tagged perhaps by. Oh, some, undo, undo, uh, undo. No. Uh, but, 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 but I wonder, and I can, and I don't think so, but it's hard for me to tell whether it's, it's um, a potential visual obstruction for either of the driveways, the, the, on, on Amherst Medias or the one north of it. I don't, well, but, let's go back. I don't think but, we're going but, to be in trouble there because if you were to take, you can see this is the length of a parking space and if a car comes out, the driver is already yeah, over the sure. sidewalk. So the uh, sign's pushed fairly far back. That's, yeah. that's the car's fender. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, before I call on um, Janet, I just want a little question. Is that the only sign? Is there no sign on the front of the No, there, of, uh, there are. Um, I did bring this up at the first meeting, but let me zoom in here. Well, point first, there, these are just four inch high pin letter signs. So there's one on this side of the building and there's one over the main door. I'll zoom in a little bit um, to the door so you get a sense that um, you know, in the, the trim that goes around the building underneath the soffiting is the logo. And then this is a pin pin mounted sign. There's a light at, in, in the soffit of this roof covering. And in the, if we go back to the sign page, let me look at the whole thing. Uh, here are, it's the backside. I don't know why they don't show you the front, but here's the, <laughs> the backside of the letters. I, I imagine this is a G, I don't know, it's backward. You'll have to use your own imagination. Uh, but it, it gives you a sense of, of what these are, um, little metal, they're only four inches high, so they're not substantial. 
You can mount them flush or you can, what they call pin mount them. So they're re raised from the building slightly. Uh, and that, I believe that's what the architect has chosen to do is have them raised off the face of the building. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And that's all the signs. So I recognize Janet and then next will be Jack. Okay. Um, I have just a couple of questions. Um, could you, I was wondering where you're going to, where the snow storage is going to be um, and on your site. I don't, I, you may have mentioned it earlier. I just don't remember. Yeah. Let me zoom in a little bit. So uh, we have been talking to the, the snow maintenance people just to make sure that we're providing what they need. And when they come in, they'll be coming in from Gray Street with their plows and their preference and works out well for us is to push the snow straight. So um, actually what I'm gonna point out, uh, we have snow storage designated here and here. Really okay. it's gonna be right around this light pole on the west side of the base. Um, and I'm gonna jump to the landscape plan because this is only utilities, but if we look at the landscape, oh good, I show it there too. Um, okay. So basically between the hedgerow and the, uh, the building itself, and these are evergreens. So the snow pile itself, particularly in the spring when it's melting out, um, it, it, that will also be hidden by, by the vegetation. Okay, and um, I had a question about how tall the ink berries were gonna be at their max, because I, I think it's a great way to shield the view of the parking stuff, but I thought it'd be nice if they were kind of on the lower side, like three or four feet. All right, ink berries. Well, we can't have them very tall for um, the, um, it's it's a Steed's Japanese holly is mm -hmm. uh, is what's being played. Is this, so when you said ink berries, you meant for this vegetation? Yes. Okay, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a type of holly. It doesn't look like the classic winterberry holly when I took a look at it, because I, I, I didn't pick these plants, the landscape architect did, but uh, landscape designer. And if we look at right here, the Steve's Japanese holly is gets four to eight feet tall, depending on variety and growing conditions. It also can be trimmed. So mm -hmm. if there's a maximum height, that the board would like to see, and it's still adequate to provide shielding for the um, the cars. And we're already up on the slope a little bit, so they don't have to be very high to hide the parking lot. Um, we're certainly happy to limit that to five feet or something like that. Yeah, I thought it was just good. I mean, I thought the slope really helps, and it'd be great to have them cover the cars, but not obstru obstructive view. So I don't have a, a hard number, but I just thought, you know, more, the more view of the Henry Hills house, the better. The other, I agree. The, other the other question I had, um, which is very two more questions, quick ones. What is the width of the parallel parking spaces? Just they I, are all right. So going back to, well, let me back out. Me and these are back. standards, right? Yeah. Well, interestingly, Amherst is mute on parallel parking <laughs> sizes, so I went with other engineering standards. Right. So um, the width is nine feet and that's, that's adequate to, to get, cars are about six and a half feet wide. Uh, so that gives vehicles enough space one way or the other. There's also no curb on this side. So there's, there's still wiggle room. Although I think, you know, if, if you do have a passenger, you're not gonna park right up against the wall. Most cars don't have passengers, but uh, it should work either way. So they're nine feet wide. This is a short okay. answer. And then my final question, which is again about storage. Um, when I was looking at the, um, the draft um, site plan review, um, I, I was wondering about the st where are you gonna store vehicles and materials during your construction? Is it gonna be on site or is it across the street or is there a plan for that? Uh, we did talk to the contractor. Uh, we're gonna be able to do all of that on site. Uh, the staging of materials, I'm gonna look at the whole thing here. Um, uh, we there. It's important that we don't drive uh, chew this area up very much. Uh, we can we can drive over it a little bit because of the stormwater system. Um, I don't want deep ruts in this area. So we're going to be able to do some material storage around here, and then the reality is the contractors are going to have to do a little bit of a dance from week to week. They're going to be operating in different places. There'll be different aspects of the site that aren't going to be as accessible. So I, I think for a large part of it, uh, they're gonna have vehicles on the west side of the building. I mean, they're, they're kind of gonna be all over is the reality of it. 
Um, and it just depends on what operation is happening now. Uh, a single designated staging area that's out of the way of everything is not mm -hmm. possible on this site. Um, mm -hmm. I, so they, but they believe they can keep everything on site and we could always look in the region um, if you know, that weren't so the case. Something you said just raised another question in my mind, which is on the green space where, where you have the, um, the, the open green space, can that be recreational space? I mean, can people walk across that? It's not, you know, if you had an event or something, it could be there. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't be driving vehicles over it when it's all yeah. said and done, but uh, the, the technology that we're using is, is commonly used in people's backyards. You go out there, you, you know, put up your lawn table and your chairs and, you know, have a picnic. Okay. Thanks so much. That's all. I see Jack has his hand up. Yes. Um, <clears throat> my comment was this on the stormwater because, you know, there's been a, another, um, uh, you know, addition with regard to the retaining wall here, uh, or excuse me, the, the, the uh, near the sidewalk anyway. So yeah. you have a lot of features, you know, going on. And I guess, I think I brought this up when you initially brought this up a year ago, but I'm wondering, is, is there a potential just to dewater the entire site? And so you have storage capability because your catch basins look to be like around 250, or excuse me, the, the outlet on the street appears to be 250, elevation 256, say, I, um, not sure, but that, you know, if, if you were, you know, you have a lot of, a uh, lot of drainage uh, control features there. I'm wondering just in terms of dewatering the site, and allowing storage for the stormwater as a result. Um, say, and again, I wish I would have brought this up last week, but, and I'm fine with what you have, but I'm just, this is my putting my two cents in. Um, you know, have you thought about putting a deeper trench along that north property boundary, dewatering the, the entire site? providing additional storage beneath the parking lot that you have designed so you don't have to pump and have all these other features, you know, going on the west side of the site, you know, for the, for the stormwater control. Um, again, I'm not a stormwater engineer as yourself, mm -hmm. civil engineer, whatever, but I just, uh, this is rattling around in my brain. Sure. No, and that's throw it out there. totally understandable. Um, yeah. it, it has been considered. Um, so what, what I will say is that generally when you're doing stormwater infiltration, stormwater management, but more the infiltration because we're trying to get water to go back into the ground, kind of like a septic field, you're trying to get it to go back into the ground. Uh, the, the best operating practices for engineering, best practices would be to operate above the naturally occurring groundwater elevation. And the, it varies over the site. It is as shallow as 21 inches. It happens to be right up here in this, this corner of the infiltration field. So we really are trying to build above the naturally occurring uh, groundwater elevation. Um, if you do dewater a site, if that pipe plugs up for some reason, now all of a sudden your infiltration system is uh, you know, two feet underwater perpetually and is never and it's not going to work again. So uh, it's, it's not something that is done. Um, it, it, you know, logically, if you could just sink dewatering trenches in, you know, oh, the groundwater goes away, but um, we, we don't count on that in the engineering world. I, I wish it were that easy <laughs> in, in a lot of cases. Uh, I would have loved to avoid a pump system, but I really do need to work with the naturally occurring groundwater table. Is okay. that uh, and just one uh, point, and I think you're all clear on this, but the bedrock uh, tends to rise on the west side, and you know I'm pretty sure you, what you have designed has enough freeboard above the bedrock. Uh, we've done we've done test pits, and we've gotten down into some um, distressed rock. Uh, we're aware of that elevation, and mm -hmm. we believe that it's not going to prohibit the 
the deepest part of the system are, is the pump and the recharge tanks. Um, we're, we're pretty sure that we can get them in. And if for some reason the bedrock were problematic and we weren't able to chip it out easily, um, it would be a very small and easily contained blasting situation, or we would be able to easily, because it's a pump, we can take these settling tanks and as an emergency fallback, there's enough room, if you can imagine, for these structures to sit down here, down here, still be within the property line. It's a very different soil and elevation situation down there. Um, we don't want to do that because it's more trenching, longer pipe, probably bigger pumps. So we, we do want to do this over here. But my instructions to the site contractor is job one is make sure you can dig these holes. And I think they can. We talk to them and they think they can. But if, you know, it's underground. So you find unusual conditions from time to time in the world of construction. But we have multiple fallback positions if we do find unusual bedrock conditions. Thank you. And, and one ask, uh, additional question. Mm -hmm. The line that goes to the north and then to the east around the building, uh, uh, this can you one? detail that a little bit? Yes. That's a roof drain. So oh, okay. the, most of the recharge okay. is capturing most of the roof water and piping it. So there's one here as well. So we've got a downspout here and a downspout here that are connecting water down into the settling tank. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't see any other board members raising their hands for questions right now. Um, I'm gonna go back to Chris Bestra and check in with her and then we could go to public um, comment. Um, I don't have any questions or comments right now, thank okay. you. And I'll also, I'm just checking attendees. I'm not seeing any of the Amherst uh, media raising their uh, hands at this time. So oh, they're just abandoning me, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> covered a lot of ground there. That was good. You're doing a good job. <laughs> so you. I'm going to um, move to public comment at this point. Uh, so you could raise your hands and I'll note how many and, and announce your names. I just want to remind everyone, uh, please limit your comments to three minutes um, or it just goes on too long. Um, and I'm watching here. I see two, three... Okay, so at this point, I see three hands. Um, and Mr. Sparkle, if you don't mind leaving uh, up your shared screen, because I think at this point, you have a lot of good drawings that could be helpful, depending Just on- Just direct me as needed. Okay, thank you. Um, and you can choose to respond or not to respond. So just raise your hand if, if you do want to say something um, after a, a comment, and I'll watch for that. Uh, I recognize Felicity Hardy. Uh, so please, if it is Felicity, unmute and announce yourself and your class for the minute taker. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. My name is Felicity Barry. Um, I live at 574 Station Road. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Welcome. Terrific. Thank you very much. Um, I submitted some written comments uh, to the board, uh, which I hope you've received. Uh, it has some attachments. And yes, I just want to yes. supplement my uh, written remarks as follows. Um, first of all, I, I, I'm not entirely sure because my screen is very small, but it appears that Mr. Sparkle is still showing a 10 foot setback on the side uh, next to Gray Street. I think that that's a, in, in my letter I indicated that I think that's a 20 foot setback because this parcel abuts the residential zone. I can't really tell, um, but I believe that the rear setback and the side setback are both 20 feet. And I raised that, that point because I think if the setbacks were properly showed, it would demonstrate to the board how small this site is. And as I indicated in my letter, I think Mr. Sparkle has done the best he can with engineering this project for this site. But the bottom line really is that the site is too small for what Amherst Media proposes. 
So in my letter, I indicated, I explained that, in fact, there are fewer than eight spaces because the handicap space, of course, has to be reserved for mobility impaired individuals. So the staff can't use that. And I can't really speak to um, Mr. Sparkle's change to the width of the parking spaces and the and the wall, I, you know, he says now that passengers can, um, can, you know, egress the cars that would be parallel parked next to the wall. I really, I don't know. But my fundamental point is that this site is just too small for the use that is being proposed. And I, I it's just, it's unfortunate. Um, and, um, I would just encourage the board to really think about this. This building is going to be there for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, however long it's going to be. And if Amherst had had a planning board back in the 50s when the Bank of America building, which is just hideous on the corner of, of um, Maine and Pleasant was built, you would have had an opportunity to weigh in and now you really do you have an opportunity to shape this project in a way that will make it work into you know way into the future and i would just encourage you to really think about your responsibilities um, and to um to encourage the applicant perhaps to downsize the building. One other point I would make, and that's about the parking management plan. It's true that Mr. Sparkle did include that in his initial uh, materials. His parking management plan basically is, if there's not enough parking on the site, then people will park on Gray Street. And yes, there's, there's capacity on Gray Street, but does the board think it's fair for all of the rest of the neighbors in Gray Street to have on-street parking for Amherst Media because this site is too small? That's a question for you guys to decide. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate your, your review of my materials. I'll meet myself now. Thank you. Do you Chris want me to respond immediately, or? Um, let me check in with Chris Bester first. Chris, I see your hand up. Do you want to make a comment about any? Yeah, I just wanted to make two comments um, in response to what um, Ms. Barry said. One is that um, Gray Street is really a front setback because it fronts onto Gray Street. So it's treated the same way as the front setback on Main Street. So it's, it's not really a side setback. The other thing that is that um, that portion of the lot does not abut uh, a property that is in the RG district, it abuts the right of way. So I think those are two things to consider with regard to the eastern side of the site. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sparkle, um, you can answer back if you want and add, I just wanted you, if you could point out with your mouse where the 10 foot setback is and then where the building um, is within the 20 feet. Okay, I'll just move this a little bit. So <clears throat> um, starting with the setback issues, the 10 foot setback on the front line on Gray Street and the front line on Main Street, I'm tracing. And then the 20 foot setback to residential on the west side, which is the a side setback. And I guess technically they're both side yard setbacks because it's a corner lot and there's no rear, rear setback. Um, those are those are established uh, on this plan accurately, uh, so that addresses the setbacks. And um, not only is Gray Street a public right of way, but I believe the property over here is not zoned residential. Isn't that also in the BN zoning? Um, so uh, there, we don't have to worry about uh, the, the setback issues on Gray Street. Um, and even if they were uh, a twenty foot setback. Uh, you can see if we doubled this, the building is still not encroaching on that. Thank in you. Terms, in terms of the site being too small, you know, we are only at roughly two thirds the coverage permissible for this zoning. So, um, you know, we're, we're not utilizing as much of this property as possible. Uh, it would be possible, though undesirable, to turn this into a parking lot. That 
I mean, nobody wants that, but it's possible. So in the realm of possibility, the site isn't too small. We're just trying to cater this project to the situation and the needs of the applicant, as well as the local historic district. And um, yes, the parking works, the spaces, for example, these spaces, uh, you know, all of them, they, they do meet the, the bylaw. Um, the questions have been come up uh, around that and the, the parking does work. And um, I think that's all I would say about that public comment. Thank you. Jack, I do see your hand up. Do you have something you want to comment on? I, I do. I mean, I, um, I think uh, Felicity, I respect um, her opinion. She's, she's uh, very good at what she does. But I'm just, I, I, I think from our experience at the site visit, you, you know, um, the lot seemed to be very adequate for what was proposed. And again, the, the, the parking uh, maneuver uh, plans that, that uh, Bucky had presented seemed to be reasonable, but I understand her concerns. But after you know being there at the site, uh, during a site visit, um, I don't really have a concern with regard to the site being too small. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go back to public attendees and I will recognize if it is Daniel J. Finnegan and then next uh, will be Eric Wilkerson and those are the only hands I'm seeing up right now. So welcome Mr. Finnegan. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dan Finnegan. I'm an attorney with the law firm Bulkley Richardson and I represent Harm's Way LLC which is in a butter to the project. Um, I echo the comments uh, that Ms. RD made and just, just add uh, for what it's worth just a couple more. I did have some comments I was gonna make regarding the front yard setback, but now that I understand uh, that there's been a special permit application filed and there's gonna be a separate hearing on that issue, I'll reserve those until that hearing where they'll probably be more relevant. Um, the only other area I would comment on uh, tonight is just the uh, retaining wall. Um, and I heard uh, th there was some discussion last time on July 1st, I believe, um, and questions from the board regarding tiebacks and whatnot for that retaining wall. And I heard Mr. Sparkle's presentation tonight and apparently he is now saying it's a, a gravity supported wall. No tiebacks are necessary. And I would just encourage the board to maybe uh, ask them if that's been reviewed by a structural engineer. And if it hasn't been reviewed by a structural engineer, that might be something that the board may want to uh, look into requiring. Um, other than that, I would just echo Ms. Hardy's uh, uh, comments that the problems with the parking, the problems with the setbacks, the problems with the retaining wall, all lead to one inescapable conclusion for this project. The site's just too small for it. So. With that, um, I will uh, uh, leave the rest of my comments regarding the setback issue for the special permit hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Sparkle, I believe you're a PE. I am. Okay. Professional engineer, licensed with the Pro state. Professional engineer, civil engineer, yes. And actually my educational background was in structural engineering. Okay. okay. I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> Good to know. Okay, thank you. And thank you, uh, Mr. Finnegan. Um, so I'm going to move to the last hand that I see raised right now. Um, I believe it's Eric uh, Wilkison. Um, if you want to announce who you are and where you're, who you represent or where you're from. Hi, yes. My name is Eric Wilkinson and I live at 20 Gray Street uh, in Amherst. Well, um, Thank you. I had a quick question and then uh, a comment or two. Um, so my quick question is, um, Will there be any renewable energy um, um, parts of this building? Any solar or any other renewable energy? Okay. Um, why don't you then give your comments too, and because we run out your time that way, and then um, I'm someone. Will okay. If if there are no if there are no uh, okay. Solar panels or or anything like that on the on the property. Um, then my comment is, uh, it's it's obvious that Amherst Media has had a long-standing, special, close relationship with the town of Amherst. Uh, until very recently, 
the town of Amherst had a, a, a link to Amherst Media on their webpage that looked just like the planning board link or the police department link. Um, and of course, Amherst Media is present at, at all of the town meetings. So there, there is a definitely special and close relationship between Amherst Media and the town of Amherst. Um, with with uh, tremendous foresight, the, the town of Amherst adopted uh, not too long ago a zero energy uh, requirement for town buildings uh, in, in response to the climate crisis that we are living in now. Um, I believe if there aren't already, uh, I believe the planning board should require that Amherst Media build uh, this building to meet the zero energy standard for town of Amherst buildings. I think this is re important for a few reasons. First, because Mr. Sparkle's water moving system like Sisyphus is gonna be pushing water uphill all day long, uh, especially in the spring uh, and winter. Uh, that's gonna use a lot of, a lot of power um, and we need that power to come from green sources. Um, and secondly, because Amherst Media is a 501c3, they won't be paying any property taxes. That means the other property tax payers in the town of Amherst are going to subsidize Amherst Media's um, town services. Um, and for that reason, I think that um, Amherst Media is obliged to build to the zero energy standard. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other um, attendees or general public comments. I'm gonna go back to panelists. Um, so, uh, and we did hear you, Mr. Wilkinson, so maybe someone else will ask a question about that, but um, I'll recognize Jack at this point. Yeah, I was just, you, know, you already covered this point, but I was just gonna say, you know, Bucky is a, is a PE and uh, uh, being a civil engineer, I think he can adequately design uh, this wall, which is pretty diminutive uh, uh, in all respects. And he's, he said that he you know, has a structural background as well. So I have no problem with, uh, with his design and needing you know, additional uh, you know, third party you know, review of this particular wall. Um, and again, I don't think the site's too small um and what was the other thing hmm. i forget you can raise your oh. hand <laughs> thank you um i'm going to recognize michael right now uh, thank you uh, i'm curious about the uh comment that has, was recently made about the, the net zero energy uh, issue uh, and I, I don't know quite how to get into this, but the real question is, what would be the design and financial impl implications of the town requiring or insisting that this building meet those criteria? Uh, and if some of the engineering or architectural folks in present could speak to that, I would appreciate it. Um, well, I'll just say one thing about the the net zero, um, that's just for public, our town buildings. Um, it would be a big step, and some towns do talk about this, but it would be a big step to require that on private property, which is, this is an example of private property. Um, and that would set a precedence, then you'd be setting that every building that has to be um, built in Amherst. And, and there's even talk about residential buildings, where do you draw the line that all buildings, so I, could be coming, but it's not here now. And that's a very big step because it does put a, a burden on, on anyone who's trying to build on their private land. Um, I don't know if, I'll rate, call some other hands, Michael, see if anyone else has um, some hands on that. It, it, which just to define, there's a difference between just trying to put green elements or sustainable elements in your building, like solar panels. It's a completely different animal when you're requiring net zero, which is a highly debated thing anyways, because sometimes it costs too much to get to that last 1% or 2%. So a lot of people debate whether zero needs to be zero, because sometimes it can be a very highly efficient um, green building and it's still only at two or three percent. A lot of times it depends on the function of the building. The higher the power they use, if it's a factory or um, 
different buildings use more power. Like uh, we debated that with the, the problem with the fire um, station. They have autoclaves where they have to use very high power at times to properly clean all their equipment. And um, that makes it difficult to get to a net zero or the DPW also uses a lot of power for a lot of their machines. So it's a very complicated thing. So I'll call on Maria and then Michael, you still have your hand up. Can I put your hand down or? Uh, no, would you leave it up please? Um, so uh, Maria? Um, yeah, that I think we've had this discussion about when that uh, zoning amendment was made, and I think it was across the board, like generally adding 10% to construction costs to get it to be like net zero or net zero capable. Um, and I agree that um, asking, that's a big ask. Um, but what I like about this process, as I have been presented and seen so far, is that, um, you know, the people representing Amherst Media have listened to the comments and addressed them as best they could when they felt it was appropriate and taken those considerations. And all of those things have made this project a better project. Um, when there are considerations that are brought forward that, you know, like Mr. Sparkle has, you know, either answered or said, you know, my client could probably consider it. You know, it sounds like there's a dialogue happening. And then there's certain things where, you know, I'm sure Mr. Sparkle, you're thinking in the back of your mind, there's no way that's gonna happen, but you're being very diplomatic and, you know, answering questions and, and getting, feedback that is, I, um, even in this last pass from our last meeting, you know, there are subtle changes. So I think that, um, yeah, the best efforts are being made to like uh, listen and do what's possible. And in the future, I mean, that's a huge south facing roof. You could always later on add PVs or something to offset um, power usage, but that to require it as part of the initial um, build I think is a big ask in particular with it not being a, um, a public building but again yeah I appreciate the sort of you know it's been gradually improving and improving I think we can see that um, that uh, you, are, you are listening and that um, you're doing what's possible and owning you know mistakes that have been made and um, I'm sure that uh, we'll hear more about the project after the special permit process and whatnot but um but so far, yeah, it's just sort of incrementally getting better and better in my perspective. So that's it. Thank you. I'll call on um, Jack and then I recognize David. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, with, you know, with the zero energy thing and being in a historic district is seems like it's a little bit uh, onerous to do both. I don't think that's, you know, a reasonable proposition uh, when they're already meeting this, you know, very rigorous historic uh, commission review of the property. Um, and then also, I, I, Bucky can back this up. I, I, I have a feeling that the pump back system up to that field uh, probably is, you know, fairly minimal uh, because it's going to have a gravity drain as well. So it's only during certain storms that it'll have to pump back, but Bucky can uh, clarify on that. Thanks, Jack. Um, so I, I recognize David. Hi, thank you. Um, I'd like to echo, I think, Maria and Jack's comments. Um, and that I think both some of the public comments about the um, site being too small is, uh, and we were, we had, uh, and I agree with Jack, it's not too small, it's it's tight for sure. There's a lot of, it seems like a, there's a lot of design, a lot of engineering for the site. And 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 like Maria, it's been responsive along the way. And, that, and I think that that's gonna be challenging, um, but it's uh, a much more attractive proposal um, than had been submitted a year or so ago, whenever that was. I, I do agree with, um, uh, Matt Massingill's letter, in part, very little part, maybe. But you know, I think the three issues are the setbacks, which that's going to that's to be heard. The parking, which is it, it is tight, but but there's a lot of attention to it, and a part of the Amherst Media's intent. And I think it's 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 I don't think that is far fetched. Is that that there will be alternative modes of people coming there. Um, and that it is prime, you know, well situated for that. 
And then the stormwater water system, which seems to be, um, the, the concerns seem to be competently addressed. And, and so uh, I think the setback is what's remaining and, and that it will be heard at, by another uh, a body. Um, but uh, it's just a lot, it's a lot of engineering. It's impressive uh, what that's, that's been done for the presentation and I appreciate it. Um, that's it, thank you. Thanks. Um, Doug? Yeah, I guess uh, I just wanted to say that all, all the comments about the parking seem to me uh, a result of the applicant's responsiveness to the design review process that they not use the western end of the site. So, you know, we can't have it both ways. Bucky and his team can't have it both ways. And if the town would prefer not to have parking in front of the Hills house, the applicant is willing to live with fewer parking spaces, a somewhat tight circulation for vehicles along the side of the building, but they're willing to do it. And I think it's only fair for us to uh, respect the collective will that's been expressed through the design review process. And I share the preference for uh, a minimal disturbance on the western end of the site. And if they're willing to put up with it, I think it's, I'm perfectly willing to let them do that. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. One, other, one other comment was, um, Bucky, uh, whether you know, I think, I mean, the, all the conversation about solar, zero energy solar is kind of irrelevant to this process. We have an existing set of requirements. And um, if we, you know, if the town wants to impose new requirements on future projects, that's a whole different conversation. Uh, but my one question for you might be, have you considered uh, making sure the roof structure is adequate for solar panels, what they call solar ready, uh, if so down the line that became something you wanted to do. So you don't even need to answer that, but I think it's just worth thinking about with your architect. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Um, so I want to call on Chris Bestra. Um, I'm not seeing that video right now. Um, it's been brought up a little bit, but I just was hoping she would uh, talk about the special permit and um, how we won't be taking a vote tonight on the SPR because we're going to continue this hearing to um, August 5th. And that's it um, when we would, because there has to be a certain amount of announcements and all that. So we wouldn't be able to do it until August 5th. Um, and this kind of special permit is something that normally does come to us. Um, Chris, are you there? I'm here, yes. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. So um, there was, uh, and probably still is, a feeling that um, this building doesn't fall into the category um, that is covered by section 6.60 of the zoning bylaw. In other words, it shouldn't be subject to doubling of the setbacks, but rather than sort of fight that fight and argue that argument, um, the building commissioner and I have made a recommendation to the applicant that um, they just go ahead and apply for a special permit to modify the front setback requirement on the main street side um, under footnote A of table three of the, uh, of the dimensional requirements. And um, you can look at that one of two ways. You can look at it as if you're actually modifying the 10 feet and therefore you only need to, if you modify the 10 feet down to five feet, then you'd only need to um, uh, deal with it that way. Or you could look at it as if the footnote A is actually modifying the section 6.6 .6 of the zoning bylaw. So one way or another, I think that um, this project falls into the category that is reasonably brought under that special permit um, uh, jurisdiction. And the planning board um, in traditionally has uh, been um, the body that considers special permits when, when the planning board has jurisdiction over the um, principal use and the, the permitting for the principal use, 
then the planning board will uh, undertake to grant um, modifications or waivers um, under special permits for dimensional modifications. So um, we received the application this week. Uh, we're going to publish the legal ad next week and the week after, and then um, we recommend holding a public hearing on August 5th and keeping the public hearing open on this site plan review so that you can discuss the two of them together. So you can hold a joint public hearing on August 5th. And if there are any issues still remaining on this project and um, things that relate to the front setback that you want to talk about, um, you can wrap it all up on August 5th. So that would be our recommendation. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Mr. Sparkle, is there anything you want to add to that or um, you know, the applicant's thoughts on, on adding to this process a little? Um. I'm not sure I have a lot to add in this particular regard. Um, I, I love the idea of net zero overall. I'm delighted that municipal buildings are trying to achieve that or closely achieve that. Um, I, I don't have an answer regarding the solar ready roof possibility. Uh, we'll have to hear from the architect about whether that's already incorporated or if that would be a minor addition. Um, I do have the thought that uh, in the local historic district commission, it's not exactly period to have solar panels. So even if we wish to install them, I think there's a good chance we would not be able to. Now that's just my estimate of what the commission would say, but they're very, very interested in the fine details of, of every aspect of this building. And I don't think they would just overlook solar panels. Maybe they would, but, um, I, but I can't speak to that or, or Amherst Media's intentions or power requirements. I'm, I'm an outside of the foundation kind of guy in this project, uh, but I'll, I'll be sure we have a conversation about that. And uh, if something comes up, I'll, I'll let you know. Thank you. Um, um, thank you. Regarding the, the special permit that will happen on August 5th, I'm gonna open it up um, comments again to the board, but I just wanted to say, I thought it might be helpful. Like you have this slide here that shows how you know, it's 13.3 feet, you know, in. Um, if we could have a site plan that just shows this, the buildings across the street and their setbacks, just to sort of put it in context, you know, because we've got green space to the west here. Um, you could look at some buildings to the east, but especially across, I think that's what we're trying to establish a little bit. What does the local area look like? All right, um, thank, thank you. you. So I'm going to open up to the board for any um, additional questions. If we do have time, uh, Chris and I were hoping to get to a read through of some of the conditions and findings also only because if we do it now, we don't have to do it on the fifth. We pay one way or the other. So um, I only see Michael's hand. So I'll call him Michael. Uh, did I, I'm trying to get my, uh, wrap my head around this. Uh, is there, were, there was mentioned earlier in the meeting tonight of this project having to go to the ZBA. Is, are we now saying, is, is, is the implication of what Chris just said that the planning board is going to decide all the special permits related to this project and it will not go to the Zoning Board of Appeals? This project will not go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. This is, the building commissioner has made that determination and he's the Zoning Enforcement Officer. Thank you. And I believe this only this one issue, right? The right. setback, right, because Michael was saying all the issues. I think this is the only issue, which mm -hmm. usually does fall into our purview more than CBA. Mm -hmm. So it, it never was going to the CBA if it isn't. It's just gonna, we'll have a SPR and SP, like we very often do. So that would be on the fifth. I recognize Janet and then, then David. Janet? I have a question about the SPR conditions mm -hmm. and, um, decision and special permit decisions. Um, we know the special permit conditions are always more onerous or kind of more um, demanding than the site plan review conditions or regulation. And so I wonder if instead of going through the site plan review um, conditions or whatever, if we wait that until August 5th, because you know the findings for the special permit would easily slide over to the site plan review findings. That, does that make sense? Um, uh, it could, we could add to them. Chris, what do you think? There's some reason sort of 
I mean, I feel like if you hit the special permit, you're definitely hitting site plan review. Other the conditions might be different. Under both. That, am I reading that correctly or just? Uh, may I answer? Yeah, please do. So I think it's fine to wait till August 5th to go over the um, conditions and the findings. And it probably does make sense to think about them all together. Um, and I had forwarded you conditions and findings before I knew for sure that um, that the applicant would be submitting a special permit application. So, you know, it's it's fine to wait, and it gives you more time to think about it. And if you have things you want to add, um, that's fine too. So, I, I would actually at this point recommend waiting. Okay, just that it might save time. Yeah, and I do just want to bring up Chris on the findings. The first one actually does address the special permit. So that's why I thought this had already been thought out a little bit with the special. Oh, permit. yeah, that's right. So it had been thought out. Um, but it, it, you can do it either way. If you want to get it sort of over with tonight, do it tonight. Uh, you don't really have anything else on the agenda for August 5th. So at this point, um, you know, I think that August 5th is going to be all about this project. So we have plenty of time to talk about the special permit and talk about the site plan review all together. Okay, so Janet, we, we heard you and I'm gonna call on some other people here just to get what what the general feeling is that people wanna do. So I, I recognize David and then I see Doug. Thank you. Um, I, I agree, I think that we, I think it seems to me premature to go over the draft conditions because we, we consider more things might may come up, and um, so I would agree. I would uh, agree with reading it at the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Great, and uh, Doug, and then I see Michael. Yeah, I thought I had seen something that the forty R conversation was happening August fifth. Is that incorrect? We said sometime in August. Sometime in August. It, so the date Chris has not been established. Had, yeah, Chris and I hadn't had that uh, discussion. And part of it um, was because uh, we had sent that, well, we voted on a uh, recommendation to go to CRC and town council regarding them to sort of reprioritize and think about, you know, the initiatives they have sent to us about the master plan update and hoping that they would uh, reconsider prioritizing the town planning de uh, department resources for more focus on bylaw and design guidelines. And part of that 40 hour consultant report is they have given a draft of some suggested design guidelines. So um, part of our weighing was waiting to, well, first we have to get that actual uh, recommendation to CRC and town council and then hear what they thought about that because then that would impact how we decide what to do with the 40 R. Does that make sense? <laughs> so it, it will still be in August. We're just not sure if it's the fifth or if it's the, the next meeting after that. Thanks. Um, Michael. Yes. Um we received about five o'clock, I received about five o'clock uh, by email a letter from uh, Mr. Massengill, uh, and uh, I've had a chance to read it, uh, give it a cursory reading, uh, certainly no more than that. Um, it seems to me uh, both uh, inflammatory and uh, important, uh, and I'm not sure what we as a board need to do about it, but it seems to me, at least, we need to discuss what to do about it. Um, and uh, I don't know whether that means, assuming we want to come to a decision on this project on the first meeting in August, it seems to me that any kind of review of this letter, if there is going to be a review of this letter, ought to happen somehow between now and then, either uh, uh, referring it to the town's attorney, or uh, I'm not sure what the, what the right process is, but it seems to me that uh, the letter needs some attention. What, what, what do you want to, what do you what? want to say about it, Michael? So, so I was going to ask him that. I was going to say, so this letter did get addressed in the applicant's um, initial talk tonight and went point by point through it. 
Um, and then after that, I opened it up to, you know, questions to the board on the applicant's presentation. Um, of course, now at this point, if, if you want to bring out a comment, or a specific comment or recommendation or suggestion, feel free to do that now. I, I, are you suggesting we should refer this to town legal counsel for advice? Yeah, I think I am. Um, again, I'm not the attorney on this group that we had two others who are. <laughs> Uh, and it's, it seems to me that uh, Mr. Sparkle uh, answered the letter in, in you know, kind of a, a, not a, as, as, as he was being, as if he were being attacked, which in, in part, uh, this letter is. Uh, but this letter is more than that, it seems to me. Um, and it's not just about uh, Mr. Sparkle's uh, response. It's about uh, a whole bunch of other things which uh, are in fact news to me and perhaps uh, are none of our business as a planning board. That's possible, but I don't know that. And, and I would like some good information, a good opinion, uh, uh, other than Mr. Sparkle's uh, rebuttal uh, about the, uh, the points brought up in the letter, that's all. So I guess at this point, Michael, you could ask specific you know, so, like we said, some of these issues have been uh, uh, talked about or whatever, and maybe we feel okay with, and others you feel uncomfortable with, you could bring them up right now and ask Chris Bester specifically for areas of the letter that we want um, guidance or interpretation on. Or are you saying you just want to send the whole letter to legal counsel for the end, like... Well, Christine, I got, I got this letter a uh, half an hour before the meeting, and I have not really had a chance to read it, except to be to read it quickly and be inflamed by it. And I can't, at this point, tell you what I specifically am concerned about. Okay. No, I hear you. Okay. But I am concerned about it, and I think it needs to be answered. Now, and that's what I meant, why I'm bringing it up now. It had nothing to do with Bucky's response to it. It has to do with the letter itself. And what should we do as a board? Should we ignore it? Is it none of our business? or should we investigate it in some way? Okay, um, and maybe some other board members have some opinion on that. We, I totally hear you, I think we all hear you, Michael, so I'm just trying to find what it is, your expectation, and what will make you feel better. Um, and so I'm looking to Chris Bestrup as our connection to the town and what she's comfortable with. I really look at the director of planning at the first level, um, and then I'll give my personal feeling later, but I'm gonna move to the other members, see if they have um, any feelings or concerns on this. Uh, Jack, uh, first I'm going to go with Chris. You're in the dark, by the way, Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> see you. Um, I'm going to call on Chris because I see her hand first. Then I see Jack and Doug and then David. So I wanted to suggest I could write a memo in response to this um, letter. And um, first of all, I want to say that I think the lawsuits that are swirling around this project have nothing to do with the planning board and the planning board should um, let those lawsuits proceed as they will. Um, you don't usually um, focus on lawsuits. You focus on uh, the job at hand, which is to decide whether this project should be approved based on the um, standards and criteria that are in the zoning bylaw. So I think as far as the lawsuits go, it's really not something to be concerned about, but I can um, send this letter to town council and ask if any of those things are things that you need to be concerned about. Um, the other topics I think I can answer in a memo and if I don't answer them satisfactorily, you can let me know and I can find out more. Is that um, reasonable? Uh, um, I'll ask Mike, he can raise his hand again if he wants to ask. I'm gonna move to, thank you for that, Chris to Jack and then Doug and then David. Um, Jack? Yeah, I feel like, um, it is, I don't know if Attorney Massengill is, is present, but I feel like we discussed most of the points that he brought up, but I am very concerned about comments from third parties coming in the day before or the day of when we've had a meeting two weeks ago. And I just, I, I feel like that's, I don't know that that's fair to the developer. And, uh, 
you know, I'm just, I'm just concerned about, we've seen this before, and I'm just concerned about when things come in at 11th hour and, okay, you know, we feel compelled to uh, prolong uh, the hearing because it came so late. And I don't understand that. I really don't understand that. So that's all I had to say. I agree. Both you and Michael have made that point. You know, we, it's hard when you get it just a couple hours before the meeting, especially when it's something you have to put some thought to. Um, Doug and then David. Yeah, uh, in response to Michael's concerns, I'm certainly not, a, not an attorney, but I find very little in this letter that has any substance at all that we should deal with. I don't think the lawsuits are an immediate concern of ours. Uh, we should be looking at the plans as submitted, the documents. Um, the most substantive thing in here is the fact that uh, the town engineer sent an email rather than a letter, in my opinion. Uh, so I don't regard, I don't think we should waste any more time on this. And I don't even think we should send it to legal counsel because I don't think there's anything in here. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Um, David, and then Michael and Janet. So David. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, I agree with, uh, with what does comment, General. I, I see, Michael, I see this as a piece of advocacy. And that, that's what a lot of the players in the field are. And it's a piece of ad, ad, uh, advocacy. Um, and I think I agree with you in that inflammatory seems like a good characterization for much of it. I did learn other things from the letter, but maybe, but, um, you know, how much does the letter bear on the matter at hand? I don't think that much. I agree with Doug there. Um, you know, we're going to be dealing with setbacks the stormwater management and the parking. We've discussed these things. Um, you know, in terms of the best use of town resources, Chris, rest drop, I don't think that it warrants writing a memo. I agree. I don't think it, you know, it's the best use of resources to, to refer to the, the, the um, town council at this moment, but um, it's just a piece of advocacy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Michael, I'm actually going to call on Janet first, just so she can say her piece. And then um, since you know, you can then follow up on for the second round. Janet? So um, I, I have spent about two or three hours on the section 6.6 .6 issue looking at the bylaw and some case law and um, the state statute. Um, and then I did ask to see uh, Mr. Moore's letter during the hearing, and maybe no one heard that. And so I do think the special permit is a, is a wiser way to go to deal with the issue of setbacks. Um, I had a question just from reading um, the letter. You know, I think I must be just immune to inflammatory rhetoric at this point, just being an attorney or a mediator or just a parent of two former teenagers. But I, um, I, did, I did, one of the things I wrote down when I was reading through the letter was, I was kind of lost about who was suing who over what. And so, that may just be interesting and not affect us. So I just kind of got wondered like who's suing who over what, but I did wonder about what, what is the effect on what we do. And so um, is there a way these lawsuits can affect our decision? And I think, you know, if the, the board chooses to issue the special permit and the permit for site plan review, um, and then, you know, maybe the lawsuits result in a different way that kind of un undoes our work. I mean, that, that may, would not be tragic. It would be, you know, maybe wasted time, but I just, I had a question in my mind is, will these lawsuits affect what we're doing? My feeling right now is not really. We'll, we'll probably go ahead and make a decision in August and then the fates will take it from there kind of thing. So that, that's it. Thank you. Michael. Uh, thank you for indulging me. I'm perfectly satisfied by the board's, uh, uh, attitudes relative to this question. And I think I agree that it would be a total waste of Ms. Bestrup's time to write a memo uh, outlining her response to the letter. Um, I, I, my primary concern uh, was the fact that it came in at five o'clock this afternoon, echoing what Jack was saying that we really shouldn't somehow, <clears throat> we shouldn't simply either not pay attention to these things that come in at the last minute uh, particularly since this project has been ongoing for a number of months uh, and uh, that we should just uh, ignore it. 
Uh, and under the circumstances, I think that's probably what we should do. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing no more hands at this point. Uh, oh, I see an actual hand. So. <laughs> Me? Yep. Well, I, I, just well, I see your hand. So I, I, I don't think we've ignored it. We've discussed it. We've considered it. We've weighed it. We haven't ignored it, but I don't think it what requires much more. And it seems like there's consensus on that, too. That's uh, my only point. Thank you. Michael, I just saw your hand come up again. I didn't even say that we uh, uh, should ignore it, uh, ignored it, but as, as, as David points out, we certainly didn't ignore it, uh, but perhaps that we should in the future. That's all. Um, thank you. So at this time, I'm just going to check in with Mr. Sparkle and Amherst Media. Um, and is there anything else they'd want to say? Because I think at this point we're close to a uh, member could uh, make a motion to continue this to the fifth. Um, I see Doug. Move to continue to August 5th. There a second? Second, second, second. Right, okay. Um, any discussion on that? Chris, is there anything you want to add or we'll just... Why don't we more? say 635? Okay. Sounds good to me. 635 on the, and is that um, work for you, Mr. Sparkle? Uh, almost certainly the whole summer has been canceled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. Okay, so August 5th at 635, we will reconvene and we'll also be opening a public hearing for a special permit. Thank so you. thank you everyone and attendees and applicants for coming. Christine, are you going to um, take a roll call vote? Yeah. Right. I just want to thank, and if I see no more hands, so at this point I'm going to end discussion and we'll take a roll call. I have to get my paper. Um, so we have a motion. Michael Burtwistle? Yes. Maria Chow? Yes. Jack Jemsek? Yes. David Levenstein? Yes. Doug Marshall? Aye. <laughs> Janet McGowan? Yes. <laughs> and uh, Christine Graham Mullen, yes, so seven, zero, zero. Um, and so we'll see everybody on Wednesday, August 5th, which I can't even believe it's going to be August. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, time. Um, so at this point, uh, Mr. Sparkle, we can probably unshare his dot great. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm gonna call on uh, item four old business. Do we have anything? On it? There's nothing on the agenda, but. No old business as far as I know, no. Okay, great. Um, new business item five. Uh, A is Apple Brook Cluster Subdivision Sub 2007-0. 00006, currently known as Hartwell Farm Cluster Subdivision, request to substitute lot two, currently released, for lot four, currently under covenant contract. So I do believe I saw Mr. Reedy earlier. Did we move him over, Pam? Oh, yes. I just, there. I just did. And I also, um, well, I have some some slides for that when we're ready. We may want to just okay. Can, I, can I just say one thing? Yeah, I was just going to say, Chris, do you want to open? So I just wanted to note that this did come before the planning board meeting as a topic not anticipated. It was sort of a last minute topic that was added to the July 1st meeting. Um, there were a lot of questions about it, which have been forwarded to Mr. Reedy. And uh, he asked to come back for tonight's meeting. So we did put it on the agenda as new business because it wasn't on the agenda on the on July 1st. Thank you. Okay, so I will call on, I think, Mr. Reedy, are you there? Oh, there you are. Oh, you're a little um, quiet, like in a can. Oh, no, that's oh, not good. Better. Good. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, we can okay. hear. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Good evening. Uh, good to see everyone for the record. Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson in Amherst here on behalf of Applebrook West, uh, Vista Terrace, 
um, seeking to effectively change out um, the covenanted lot from lot four to lot two. Uh, this is a property 1194 West Street was the cluster subdivision that the planning board approved. I am not gonna go through all of the history that dates back to I think 2007. Um, I will just give you an update. Um, so within the subdivision, lots three and lots eight are completed and sold. Uh, lot four is very near complete and we expect to close by the end of July, hence this request uh, to change the covenanted lot from lot four to lot two. Uh, lots five and six are in construction with signed purchase and sales and both to be finished and sold by the end of the year. Uh, and lot seven has an accepted offer and they're in the process of providing minor design modifications. So the only one that hasn't had a purchase and sale on it is lot two. Um, and so a couple of the questions, and maybe I'll just go through them. There were nine questions that Ms. Brestrup sent over to me. One, why was lot four chosen to be held? Why other lots were requested to be released? And there was really no reason. It was just kind of picked out of a hat and the, the developer thought this lot's as good as any. Um, why was not lot two not held instead? And again, the same thing. He, he didn't know what the market was going to do and just lot four was the lot that he chose. Uh, how does the value of lot four compare with the value of lot two? He would think it's probably five to $10,000 difference in the final base price of the house and the lot. And I would think that would be my opinion. Lot two would probably be that much less than lot four. Um, the, the value of these lots are probably $150,000. I think if you look at the registry um, uh, lot, let me look at it. Lot three. Uh, which is adjacent to lot four with the, with a completed house on it sold for $569,000. So that's the, that's the value of what we're talking about. And, and the lot itself, I think they attribute about $150,000 to it. Um, both lots appear to have drainage easements on them. How do these drainage easements affect the buildability of the lots? The drainage easements in lot two appear to be more problematic than the drainage easement in lot four. And the response is, if, if you look at the extent of the drainage easements, I think there's actually, um, there's two drainage easements on lot four. There's one on the easterly side and westerly side. You know what, Mr. Reedy, can we share screen? Can someone pop up the site map for this? Mm -hmm. We can. Sorry to interrupt. I just, it will help, like, as you describe a visual, it makes it so much easier. Sure. And we don't have it in our packet, so. I think it came to you on July It's 1st. in my packet. Yeah, it was in your packet, Christine. A map? Yeah. Yep. Attached to the letter. Perfect. Oh, this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, also, I like it for the public because they don't know. Sure. You sure. know, yeah. So just back to the easement. So we're looking at four and you're saying there's two there and. Yeah, and Pam, I don't know if you can blow that up at all. Um, I'm, I'm maybe... gonna put it on um, slideshow. Okay. Which helps. How's that? Perfect, perfect. Okay. So lot four is at the top of your screen, the top left right there. And so you see the building circle at the top of the building circle is one of the drainage easements. And then if you go to the bottom right of the building circle, there's a little, right there is another drainage easement. And then there's also a common driveway for lots three and four share a common driveway. Lot four is burdened partially by that common driveway as is lot three burdened. And I only raise that because then, Pam, if you go to the, if you see lot two, Mm -hmm. There you are. Perfect. So on the, so you have the building circle. Yeah, you go. So that's the drainage easement is right there. Yes. Um, and then there is no common driveway easement burdening lot two. It is benefited by a common driveway uh, or a driveway easement rather on lot one. 
So, you know, I think looking at it personally, I think lot four is probably more desirable than, than lot two. Uh, but I don't think that the drainage easement is going to have a material impact. Um, especially, you know, we have lot, lot four is going to sell and it's going to sell for more than lot three. Uh, so I think it's like $600,000. Uh, and lot three was 569. So I would expect lot two certainly to sell uh, at some point, which probably goes to the next step is what does it cost to complete the roadway? And based on our um, count, it's about $35,000. And so with lot two, assuming $150,000, there's sufficient collateral there. I don't know if Chris had shared uh, with the board what was left to be done, um, but I think Jason took a look at it and it didn't seem like he was um, nervous with what had had to be done. Um, I think I talked about the number of houses sold and then why can't the planning board choose which slot should be held? You can, but the only problem is that you're putting the developer in a tough place because he has contracts on all of the other ones. And so given the minimal nature of what needs to be done to complete the subdivision, you know, having a lot to, and then I think um, Mr. Levenstein had su suggested thinking about bonding, um, you know, some sort of cash surety or something else besides covenanting, which is on the table. But the original request was, aren't we far along enough just to eliminate any of the covenants related to the subdivision? And then we didn't get a response from Jason skills or how much it was going to cost. So we thought, well, instead of just giving no collateral, why don't we switch it from lot four to lot two? So we thought at least for this time being, lot two would serve as sufficient collateral. And then we'll explore if we can you know, provide you with evidence of how much we think it's going to cost, have Jason corroborate that, and then think about um, maybe just getting a bond for that amount because lot two at some point is going to be sold. And I don't think that the top code and all those other things are going to go on until lot two is completed because otherwise you're bringing heavy equipment. I mean, you've heard this before. So you're bringing heavy equipment across um, the roadway that's just had a top coat put on, which isn't the best thing for the top coat. So we thought that this was a good solution, protects the town. Uh, and then we'll, we'll start to look into some sort of um, bond because I think that's probably the best thing to do. Uh, I see too much. Um, I'll open it up to board questions. I see Janet, then Jack, then David. Janet. So I, I went out and looked at the lots today because um, I was somewhat confused. I, I, I kind of thought lot four was going to be an empty lot, but it has a building on it. And so um, it seemed, and when I looked at lot two, it was very steep, um, which you sort of can see by the lines. And if I was going to pick between lot two, which has, is empty, and lot seven, which is also empty, I would have picked lot seven just because it's flat and big. Um, and so I began to worry, oh, maybe lot two is the most undesirable one. And in fact, it's the last one that has no offer on it. And so that got me a little bit worried. Um, I was what my, my question that was my statement. My question is um, when when in fact would the developer finish the road? Are they gonna will he be waiting until lot two is sold? Or if all the other houses are in but lot two is still unsold, would they just complete the road? Because that I'm trying I'm thinking about the Amherst Hills problem. Sure, that I'm very so well aware of for us. <laughs> and I'm just wondering. Are you, is it going to be waiting until that last one is sold? And what happens if it doesn't get sold for a while? I mean, that's frankly part of the reason why the town has the, the collateral of lot two is that it's to ensure performance. I mean, that's what we're doing is we're giving the town, essentially, we're giving the town a mortgage to say, we will complete it. And if we don't complete it, you have this collateral to make sure that it's, it's completed. You know, it's not, we don't just give it to you because we, we like it. It's, it's to ensure performance. Mm -hmm. I would suspect that in an ideal world, it would be completed after lot two is completed. 
Mm -hmm. because then you don't have to bring the foundation trucks, the excavators, all of the, the um, earth moving equipment um, and, and any of the other dump trucks, et cetera. Um, and to that space, maybe he looks, and I was going to say, maybe he looks to complete past lot two, but I think there's a lot of economies in just doing one top coat and not trying to patch it at any place. So, I mean, I think to answer your question, he would look to do it after lot two. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if there's going to be an issue, I think we just have to have a conversation with the town um, and, and maybe put some outside date on it. Are you done, Janet? Yeah. Okay. Um, Jack and then David. Yeah, I was just, I was curious about um, in terms of what's going on with the town and, you know, interest in these lots. And it looks like it's the building happened pretty rapidly, which is, which is a good thing. And, but I'm wondering about the demand and, what the timeline might be in terms of uh, the completion of the subdivision from you know the demand that you that you've seen from from the the site owner. Sure. Um, thank you. I, I would I would think that by the end of next calendar year it will be completed. I think he'll have see three and eight are gone four should be conveyed this month five and six should be done by the end of this year um that leaves seven and two for next year and i think paul's plan and russ's plan was to have them two per year and then to end it at 2021 um at the end of next year to have them all sold off i just clarify so is seven sold or not sold Seven is, there's an accepted offer and they're just okay. working through, because it's built to suit. So they're working through like just final design modifications. Because if you, if you go down there and Janice can probably uh, uh, attest is they look somewhat similar to each other. And so typically what'll happen is that they'll say, we want this with some modifications to it. So that's why, so lot seven, uh, everything else is under agreement, save for lot two. That's what I thought and I part of this, I don't know that they've marketed lot two that much. Jackie Zusko, who some of you may know, uh, has been doing the marketing for it. I think it's uh, a net zero community. I may be speaking a little bit out of line, but I know that there's a solar component to all of these um, houses in the subdivision, there will be solar. They're working, I forget the company that they're working with, but there will be solar on the roof of all these uh, houses. I don't think they're net zero. I think they've just got some green elements. But anyways, um, so I'm gonna put Janet, Jack, are you done? Yep. Um, yes, thank and then, you. So David and then Doug. Excuse <clears> me, <throat> thank you. Um, I, I think, you know, we're, we're looking out for the interest of the town for the completion of safe roads in the cluster subdivision, I think is what I believe is the matter at hand. And that, that there's um, a sale that's going to go to occur um, on a, on a restricted property. If we're going to, we want, we want security, the collateral for the completion of the road. And it seemed like, Mr. Reedy, it seemed like you also were suggesting that further down the road, you might, you would consider switching it to a bond. It's like, well, why not do that now when the sale is consummated? That just seems to me to be removing that, an unnecessary kicking the can down the road of switching it to lot two, waiting for lot two to sell, or in, in the interim, uh, um, uh, switching the the, the 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 restriction to uh, a bond. It seems why not just let's establish the bond now, and then and then 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 there's no um, there's less uncertainty from the town's point of view. It seems to me about securing performance to complete the road. So, sure. so if you could I, speak to that, I appreciate sure. that. Thank you. So I guess my response would be why not allow some of those funds to be used 
for the actual completion of the work instead of just putting it into a bond for the work to be done. And then he's essentially paying twice. Um, and so by switching from lot four to lot two, it allows the sale to happen. And then the cash is freed up for him to, to continue to bill um, because I'm sure he's taking some of the money from lot four to pay the contractors from lot four and then also to finish the buildings, right? It's just, it's moving that money around and then that would also free up money um, to be able to do the work on the roadway so that, or, you know, the sidewalk um, instead of, like I'm saying, paying twice and just saying, we're going to take this money, put it into escrow, and then we have to come up with an additional amount of money to actually do the work to prove to you that we're doing it. So the, the solution to us was there's enough value in lot two. Um, let's use that. And then let me have the conversation with Paul to say, you know, and Jason skills. And then maybe we come back to you and say, here's our timeline, you know, to give you just a definitive timeline of this is what's going to happen. You know, we anticipate, you know, finishing at this date. And if it doesn't, here's the, the backup plan. Just so, you, because I know with the Amherst Hills, one of the things that you were looking for and the representation I think was made, not to cross too much here, but that there was going to be some work done, I think, this summer. And I think just for you going forward to get some timeline and some, okay, if there's a deadline and you don't meet this deadline, something else has to happen. And I think what I'd be representing to you is, if you allow the covenant to be switched to lot two, let me talk to Paul, come up with a plan, talk to Jason Skills, come up with a plan, and I'll be back to you and pick a number, 30 days or 45 days, something like that, to say, here is our plan. Uh, here is what we're going to do. And all the meanwhile, you have lot two. I mean, lot two is a building lot in Amherst. I think we've all seen building lots in Amherst, the cheapest I've seen, and it was priced to sell on West Street. So 116 right across, I think from Mill Lane, there was a, a lot there sold for $85,000. And so there's a house on it now, I think, uh, I could remember who did it, but I'm not going to. Um, so that's what you're talking about for a housing lot in Amherst. And so this, you, especially if it is $35,000, which there was nothing in Jason's email that was overly concerning to me, I think for you to take this as the collateral, let me do a little bit more work on my end and come back to you and say, here is the timeline. Um, you know, I think you're protected and for whatever it's worth, you know, I'm working with the developer here. So hopefully that means something to you that, that I will make sure that we are back and we are doing what we said we were going to do. We're hearing your proposal, Mr. Reedy. Um, so, I'm just going to let all the members have their comments um, and then we can get back to what you're putting on the table. Do you have anything else, David? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to move and call on Doug and then there's Michael. Doug, yeah. Yeah, I wanted first to just say, isn't this a problem that happens over and over? Like in every subdivision or is the creation of collateral is that just a new thing and we don't know how to deal with this I would think it would happen every time we don't have many subdivisions in Amherst lately okay good point so the second thing I wanted to do was to ask Tom you made some reference to the marketing of various lots and that maybe lot two would be marketed next year does that mean that lot four has been actively marketed this year so in a sense, you've created this problem? I don't know that it was specifically withheld from the market. I don't know that lot two was said, let's not market it or lot four, let's push it. I, I think the genesis of this was you, Jackie would bring folks to the site and they would say, I want this lot. And I think that my point was, I don't know that there has been any sort of uh, marketing blitz, full court press, whatever term that you'd want for lot two specifically. I don't know that it's happened on the other lots. They might have just naturally sold because people go back and they say, wow, lot four, if it's me, lot four, lot five are probably my most desirable lots. You're going to get the least amount of traffic. You're going to have some connectivity to, uh, there's a path. There's like a trailhead right at the end of that dead end. Um, so I think it just might have been the, the organic way that these things sold. 
So I don't want to make it seem like they've uh, exalted one lot over the other. I think it's just natural selection to a certain extent. Okay, thank you. So the, the third thing I was going to say is I, I do think it would be wise for us to uh, incorporate a timeline on this in case the, you know, if we go forward with lot two, I don't want to have, you know, the sub, the sub course deteriorating <laughs> and suddenly a $35,000 top coat becomes rebuilding the entire road. So I'd like to see some sort of deadline incorporated if we go forward with this. Thank you. I just want to ask a follow up on his on Doug's part two. So if lot four was what was being held as security, how does it get to the point there's actually a house built on it right now? So it's a it's a great question. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Is it really? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, and I got an email, I mean, when did I email Chris, maybe three weeks ago saying, hey, um, <laughs> this, we have this sale coming up at the end of July, there is a covenant on it, uh, what can we do? Oops. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, so I said, oh, okay, well, here's what we'll do. Um, so, we, yeah, I mean, ideally, no, this isn't, this isn't how it happens, you, you have these things lined up well before you get to this point. Um, I mean, fortunately, we we do have a lot too available instead of them all being spoken for. And then I think, you know, then we're just sh shifting things around or coming up with an alternative solution. But yeah, it's it's not ideal that we're here. We're okay, here. Um, thank you. Uh, Michael? Yeah, I, two points. I think I drove, I drove through, the, through there this afternoon as well. And it seems pretty uh, undeniable that lot two is significantly less attractive than lot four, with or without a structure on it. And that any structure on lot two is going to be, um, although in the same style as the other homes, presumably, uh, will be placed in such a way to be disadvantaged visually and, and it won't be as, an, as attractive a lot. But the real question I have, and then that, that goes back to the notion of how did we get here in the first place and the oops question. Um, my other, other concern is that we should not forget that in the process of uh, setting aside funds to finish the road, whether it's by bonding them or by covenanting them, we need to remember that the developer promised to build a parking lot and an access road to the parking lot to connect with the trailhead. Uh, and is that presumed, I would presume that would come under the same kind of covenant. Uh, is that true? Or if not, why not? That's a good question. I don't, um, I don't know the answer to that. He, he did promise to do it. Uh, he is going to do it. We've had discussions with Dave Zomek, part of the thinking is, do you want the public accessing? Because I, I think you'll hopefully all remember where that entrance was. It's it's between the the pole of lot seven and, and where it says space on the open space um, on the right side of the plan. Right. And, and so part of the thinking was not to make an attractive nuisance, not to invite the public to a, a construction zone. Plus, ultimately, that land, that open space is going to be conveyed to the town of Amherst. It's used for stockpiling of material right now. We've talked to town council with um, the COUNSEL, and we've talked about licensing and just timing of all of that. Um, besides a covenant, I know what you did in Amherst Hills was um, certificate of occupancy. I think it's probably best for it to be covenanted for here. Um, I don't know if Ms. Brestrup has any other thoughts on it, but I think that'd be fine. So when Jason looks at it, not only is it top coat and sidewalk, uh, but it probably also parking lot and, and whatever, I think the some sort of shack he was going to do. And the access um, road to the park. The access, thank you, in that area. Thank you. Um, so before I go second round, um, for, I just wanted to say something, then I'll call on Chris Bester. So, um, normally, and we've learned this with Amherst Hills, that it isn't that it gets finished, it gets close to finished, like 90%. It's one 
last house getting built is not going to destroy your road. It's not, but if you had, and this is a very small subdivision, let's put it in perspective. I mean, compared to like Amherst Hills, when you have dozens more homes, that would be a lot more construction. So we're actually getting to the point, if there's only one lot, you're at 90%, we are ready. And maybe we do have to wait for Jason skills. We're actually ready for that list of what has to get done and what would it take for the town then to accept the road is really what we're talking about. We're actually that close to, to that. And just um, now I know why I didn't like this drawing. Um, not that I don't like this drawing, but this shows one perspective, but it doesn't show the houses that are built or the foundations on it, which give you a deeper perspective. So if I could see what where the house is and how big it is in that building circle of lot four, which it is by far a more desirable building circle than lot two, that has it drive up past the median of the circle. So you're a lot more limited in where you're gonna be able to um, build your house on that. So that's why I wanted another drawing, which if you come back, that might be helpful to see the building circles and what's actually built there to give some perspective. So I, I, you know, I know Chris and I have had a couple of um, back and forths, like had we heard anything from Jason Skeels. I think we're at that point where we need that checklist and that estimate and it does have to be looked at because maybe it's just, yeah, like you sort of were proposing, Tom, we need dates or whatever. Like, let's make the plan now. Let's start figuring out when this is all gonna get finished out. So um, I'm gonna call on Chris Bestrup, and then if there's more questions, I'll start with Janet um, for additional. Um, Chris, you there. So I just wanted to say that I did speak with Dave Zomek and he uh, did say that um, the developer would be building that driveway and parking lot into the open space lot, which unfortunately the driveway and parking lot doesn't show on this plan, but I yeah. can get you a plan for the next time. And the right. other thing is that um, I reached out to Jason and he's working on the cost estimate, but he didn't have it ready for today. So um, right. we'll have it soon. Excellent. So a little bit more dialogue um, and we'll have more information. So um, thank you, Chris. Uh, I'll call on Janet McGowan if there's any other last questions or information you wanna ask for when this comes back. So, Janet? So I, um, and I also had the question of how did the house wind up on the lot? Um, and you know, I think it's probably best to avoid the oops and kind of a last minute scurrying around. I do wanna speak in praise of um, having, um, a bond because I, I had a $300,000 bond that I used to pay a thousand dollars a year on in New York state for, for another matter. And so it's, if, if you needed a 50,000 or a hundred thousand dollar bond to cover the road and maybe the parking lot, I don't think it would cost the developer very much. And I, I hope he's not in a financial situation where an extra thousand dollars a year or so would put him on the edge. And so Presumably, you know, so I, I, I think that the bond, like when David was suggesting that, that made sense to me. It's so much faster, it's clean, it's not that expensive, and it's ready cash. And so, you know, the town could call it when it needed it and not go through kind of a complicated thing. And so that might, to me, that looks like the easiest way. I think it's very inexpensive. I, I may be wrong that a $50,000 bond is very expensive in Massachusetts compared to New York, um, but I just, I just think that's maybe a cleaner and faster option maybe going forward in this process or the next subdivision. Clarify, why do you only want a 50,000? I thought the top cut was only gonna be 35,000. Is that right? Did someone yeah, that was, so what the developer expected for the, for everything else to finish the roadway uh, or the infrastructure, they thought $35,000 was. Yeah, I thought it was like a hundred or 50 or a hundred. I'm just picking that number out to be bigger. That seems so low. It can be 15,000 to do a driveway. <laughs> but I mean, that's the whole driveway, but. But uh, yeah, I mean, I. But wow, but yeah. I'm, well, I'm taking their word for it. Deal. So anyways, Jason Skeels will also be getting what he thinks because there could be other um, things they want done to accept the road as a public road. So we'll hear from him. Um, Chris Bestrup. So one thing is they're never going to accept this road as a public road because it doesn't meet public road requirements. Um, it's not wide enough and it doesn't have some other aspects of it that we would want in a public road. So that's not what Jason's looking at. What he's looking at is whether it's sufficient to provide access to the homes that are going to be along it. 
So that's one thing. What was the other thing? Um, there was another thing I wanted to say and just completely slipped my mind. So anyway, maybe I'll get back to it. That's a great concept for us to know, though, that this will never be expected to become a public road, even with that trailhead and everything on there. So this is separate than Amherst Hills. That's all about they want their road to be accepted by the town. Yeah, I remembered, I remembered the other thing I wanted to say. Last night I attended a class given by CPTC, and it was all about ANRs and subdivision control law. And the fellow who gave the class said that if you are accepting a bond or escrow, you should accept at least twice as much as you think the, the work is going to be because you never know when the work will get done. And that's something that we found out about Amherst Hills, that a subdivision that was started in the 1990s still isn't done, you know, 30 years later. So um, work has, uh, and, and we got a cost estimate to do this work in 2013 or something in Amherst Hills, and now presumably the cost has gone up. But anyway, that's aside. We did get, I did get this clear recommendation from the fellow who gave the class last night that if you're going to accept a bond or escrow amount, um, it's worth thinking about going for twice as much as you think the work is gonna be worth. So we're still just holding that lot four or what would be switched to lot two. How does that work? Like, let's say the road isn't getting finished. It's four or five years from now. Like, how does this actually legally work? Well, the way it works is that the developer is supposed to have the incentive to market the lot and sell the lot. And if he doesn't, then somebody else would come in and purchase the lot and then not be able to build on it until the roadway is finished. So some way, one way or another, either the developer who currently has the property or a new developer who would come in just to develop that lot would have an incentive to finish the road. Um, and I wanted to go back to lot four and why it has a house on it. And I think it's a lack of communication and somehow um, it never got, the information never got to the building commissioner that that lot was being held in um, as part of the covenant. Um, and whoever is going to purchase the lot will see that there's a, certificate of performance on file at the registry that holds that lot. So that lot really shouldn't be built on. And how it happened, I don't know, but apparently there's a lack of communication. So um, what can I say? It's, it's one of those things and we have to deal with it now. Thanks, Chris. Um, I recognize David and then I see Jack. <clears throat> Thank you. It's an unfortunate situation. Um, and you know, I, I, it's not. I, I, I do, would not. It's. I would would not want to frustrate the sale of the the, the property. Um, however, um, there are a, a number of concerns, and that even though, you know, Mr. Reed, you, you we can come back with a time frame. Once in thirty or forty-five days for the completion of the road and you know, whatever milestones. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure how, what's, how that's enforceable once the restriction is removed from lot four and it's sold and put onto lot two. There's just, there's, I think there are a lot of concerns that have been, that are legitimate, that were created by the, sale and then the 11th hour to the uh, request to switch the restricted lots. And so, you know, I'd, I'm, that's why I thought the bond was a creative solution to, or some solution at least, not so creative likely, to, to, to make it work both ways. And I, I, would, be, I would really like to see what would another uh, a potential solution um, so that the sale is not frustrated or unduly postponed, but I can't think of one. So I'd welcome more creative minds. Thank you. Thanks, I see Jack. Yes, um, I'm just following up with uh, Chris Brestrup's comments, trying to uh, edify myself with regard to 
public road status and and why this one versus say Amherst Hills um, you know isn't a public road well this developer if you don't mind my just um, but, but butting in no, please do. this developer made it clear from the beginning that he didn't want to build um, a road to the town standards that he um, told the planning board back in 2007 that his intention wasn't to have this road be taken over by the town and therefore the town allowed him to build a road that I believe is only 16 feet wide which works for the eight houses that are being built here but it's really not um, built to the town standards so the town planning board told him at the time well you know you're not building the road to the town standards and therefore the town will not be accepting this road and he said I agree with that. So um, it's it's narrower in terms of its um, right of way cross section, and it's different in other ways as well. I don't know if we required it to have trees on every lot. Anyway, it's just not. It doesn't meet the subdivision um, requirements. So at that time, the developer and the town reached an agreement that this road would not be accepted by the town as a town way. Whereas Amherst Hills was a different condition. Amherst Hills roadways uh, purported to be built to town standards. They're of the proper width, they have the proper materials and um, the proper right of way, et cetera. It just didn't get finished. But that road, once it is finished, will be built to town standards. Does that explain it? Thank you, Chris. Chris it does. Just, just want to add on, does this um, road, at, will it be snow plowed by the town? No. They'll do their own private. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Um, Michael? Uh, I want to support Jack's and uh, David's notion that uh, a bond is probably, and Christy, and uh, uh, sorry, um, Janet's uh, suggestion that a bond may be the best way to go on this. Uh, we had a we had a miscommunication relative to the, at, at, well, a mis that's probably the best way to characterize it. A miscommunication relative to the notion of building a house on lot four prior to releasing the lot. Uh, there's no real reason to, uh, it seems to me, to expect or not expect a similar miscommunication concerning the building of lot four, a uh, lot two. Um, so burned once, okay. Burn twice? I don't think so. Uh, so I don't think the notion of a, a new a switching the covenant from four to two is a good idea. I think a good idea is establishing a bonding, appropriate bonding number right now and releasing lot four in exchange for the right kind of bond. And I don't, I don't know enough about what that right kind of bond would be to go much, much past that. But I think that's the direction we should be moving in. Thank you. All right, so Mr. Reedy, you've heard from the board. Uh, there's been a lot of suggestions and requested information. When do you think you would want to or be able to come back to us for this? So I guess what I will ask is, I've got a closing scheduled for July 31st. Um, I, I don't know that lot two has zero value, which is kind of how everybody's talking about it. Um, as I understand it, I think we're going to be finishing. So what needs to be done is the asphalt berm, the top coat, and the sidewalks. Um, water, sewer, drainage are all done. Binder coat of asphalt has also been installed um, per Jason Skeels. The street lights? I know there was one or two or something. I don't know the answer to that. It wasn't on his list, and I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I believe the paving was going to, is going to be done this fall because lot five will be done at that point. And so that was the biggest concern is traipsing all the way down to the end. And so, I mean, what I'd like to request or suggest is to release lot four, put the covenant on lot two, um, put a building permit moratorium on lot two, like you did for Amherst Hill so that this doesn't happen again where a lot like it happened with lot four and there was a building on it. So then you've protected yourself or you've protected the, the neighborhood um, of this happening again. 
you keep lot two and then I come back in, I mean, you pick the date with information both on what bonding would look like or a definitive timeline or both to say, you know, and even a, a springing condition where I come back and say, let's keep it on lot two, let us use our money because uh, with all due respect to, to Janet, I don't know that, I, I think it depends what you're looking to bond for. Um, and so I don't think it's just a, a strict cash dollar amount and say 50,000 costs 1,000, it's probably well $50,000 for what? So it, if lot two is covenanted, I come back and I say, we will have this done. Here is the list of what needs to be done. We will have this done by this date. And if it's not, then here are the consequences. And whether it's, um, it, and it, then it's probably switching it over to a, a bond. Because what I'm trying to do is allow the sale of lot four to go through, um, get a realistic timeline to, that we're going to be doing this and then to use the money to actually do it instead of bonding to do it. Because then, like I said to David, it's instead of 35000 it's $70,000, assuming that the bond company may want a dollar for dollar amount instead of just like what you'd expect the bond to be. So that would be my request. And I can come back at the, I know August 5th, I think is the date you were talking about. You only have one other thing on the agenda, depending upon what happens with the 40R but I could be back then with this information. And you'd put off your closing for a couple of weeks or something. Well, under my request, I'm asking you to switch to lot two so oh, that my right closing now. goes as scheduled. You're going there. I'm, I'm going there. <laughs> I'm going there. All right, I'm gonna call on Maria. Uh. Gosh, that's so convoluted. Uh, I guess I didn't follow the point about why you, um, I know you want to sell lot four, but then upon the sale of lot four, you would have, or the developer would have money to do the work. So instead of saying, you know, well, why not save the money and not put it into a bond so we can do the work, you'll have had extra cash, I guess, to, to do the work. So it seems like it's in our best interest to still request the bond as well as put a time frame. I think I forget who mentioned it, but so that we, you know, it doesn't go, go on and on and then the bond, the estimate attached to the bond it goes out of date. So I guess I don't understand the logic about why we can't have the bond um, when you say, you know, we'd rather put the money to the doing the actual work. Because I don't know frankly i don't know how much a bond for this work is going to actually cost so and Jason steals is working on that correct i think someone mentioned so yeah but he's working on the estimate i don't know that he's working on the bond amount so if if it's a 35 let's say it's forty thousand dollars to do this yeah okay and let's say we go to a bonding company and they say okay give us forty thousand dollars right it's it's the same as like a cash surety i just don't know what that's going to cost if it costs five thousand dollars totally different story but if it's going to cost the same amount that it would to actually do the work, then why am I even putting it into a bond and why am I not just doing the work? So if you require us to bond, mm -hmm. then I'm double paying versus just paying directly from the proceeds. And so kind of my placeholder is I'm going to hold lot two and I'll be back. That, I mean, that's essentially what I'm saying. This is the placeholder. It has value. You'll be made whole take this, allow me to sell lot four, and then I'll be back. I feel like a developer right now, but that's, that's, that's okay. what I'm asking. That's what Aren't I'm asking. Aren't you a little bit? Aren't you representing? Yes. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, <laughs> with the lawyer's head on, we'll do that. So on Murray's point, the money that we're talking about, the bond is so much lower. You earlier said that the lot sell for 150 and that yes. lot three with the house on it sold like 560. Yes. There's a house on lot four. There's a lot of money transpiring in this. It just seems like less money to deal with a bond than to even hold a lot that's 150,000. Exactly. Yep. yep. And, it, and it may be. And it, and it, what I'm saying is, it may. So after this, assuming that you release lot four, we go to lot two, I'm going to say, okay, Paul, you got to take this money and just finish the roadway because I'm not going to go through this again. Um, and then we're not worried about a bond. I tell you the timeline, but you have lot two just to make sure that you have something. I mean, if you want to release all of them, I'll take that. I mean, I've got no problem there, but I, 
to me, this seems fair because then at least you have something. And yeah, everybody's looking saying it's not as desirable. But like I said, even if it's half of what we're, if you sell over $75,000, you're still covering everything that's there. If I was asking for, if there was $150,000 worth of work and I'm saying leave one, that's something different. I mean, frankly, you <laughs> released, you being the board, released all the other lots except one of them for all the work to be done. And now I'm saying keep one for this little bit of work and you're saying, no, we're not gonna do that. I mean, that to me, that's just kind of tough. I know it's coming that's from- what we're trying I to get to, Tom. We're just trying to find out the variables, the X, the Y, and the Z, so that we can figure out the equation. It, we're, it's like pulling teeth here. We're trying to like, okay, if the lot is worth 150 and we're saying yes. lot four right now is worth 560, I'm assuming, somewhere around there. If I lot. can't sell lot four, though, until you release the covenant. That's my, that's, right. so there's and no then, cash. You know, we're hearing different numbers on what it's going to cost to finish the work. I mean, I'm hearing 50,000 to just fin or 40,000 40, to finish the work, and yet we're tripping over 560,000. Like, I don't, if the developer just wants to get this done, there just seems like this could have been expedited before like this last minute Sam thing. I, I totally agree. I mean, and frankly, why I didn't come to the last hearing was because I thought it was pretty simple switching out one for the other. I mean, it's a, it was a lot for a lot. They both have value. There's minimal work to be done. And so, plus it was like 11 something at night when you guys were going to hear it. So I, I didn't think... Um, oh, we were still going. <laughs> yeah, we and called you. We called you. Where um, we were, what, what we've experienced this past year. I'm sorry, your other hat that you were wearing is called Amherst Hills. So I know. We don't do a lot of subdivisions here. So this has been a huge learning experience sure. from Amherst Hills and this. Um, and maybe that's some of the fumbling. There's been some oopses, some balls dropped, and now we're sort of trying to come up to speed here on what is the due diligence? How are we supposed to do this right? And a little of this, like, if you give, it sounds like development talk. If you give me this, I'll give you that. And we're just not that kind of board right now. We're like, we just want to do the right thing. So I understand you have a closing on the 31st. You know, can you push that closing back? Or is that like, impossible because you I mean, always care about closings being delayed i'm, I'm always an, an optimist but i don't you know i don't know what if any penalties will be associated. i'm just trying to think of what if any penalties will be associated with pushing it back i don't know if the buyers of this house are selling their house and looking to you know and then all of a sudden there's a chain reaction um you know, to, to simplify it, what I'll say is you were holding one lot to have all of the work for the subdivision done. And now that a great majority, so you only had lot four. It's not like we came back and kept asking for release of lots. Your certificate of performance released all of the lots except for lot four. So that was for, for everything that needed to be done. You thought that one lot was sufficient. Mm -hmm. And now that we've done all of this work, you're saying, you're telling me for the rest of this work, one lot is not sufficient. I mean, that's that's what I'm hearing. And all I'm trying to say is just no. switch lot four for lot two. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna start calling, there's a lot of hands up, so I'm gonna call them. And please consider when you're answering also, give some feedback of what you would like the board to do tonight, members. Like, I wanna hear from you, What what is it you're comfortable with? So I, I'll call on Doug and then we have David and Janet. Uh, okay, so it's so it's taken a little while for it to sink in to my head that this is never going to be a town road. So that kind of makes me wonder, do we care? You know, I, now I realize the people that have bought lots in this subdivision had the assurance that there was a lot held to finish the road work. But if we just say, okay, you know, we're fine with switching to lot two, and it, for some reason that ends up being inadequate, you know, we did our best. It's not between us and, 
you know, we don't care what happens to this road. I mean, it could just never happen. Um, so, you know, maybe it's it's already getting late enough that I'm starting to give into things, but, uh, um, you know, I mean, I mean, so that's that's kind of where I'm at at the moment, but I, but I guess I have another scenario that I'm thinking about, which is if we obstruct the sale on a lot that the developer has built a house, you know, he's sunk a lot of money into that house that he's not going to get until something happens and he may not have the money to go and build the road, you know, we may have put him in a bind. So, no, I think he put himself in a bind. Fine. It, You're right. It, just wanted to clarify, it's not us. Okay, so, but I, but I just wanted to mention that could be the situation right. and no, I don't know that it I is. I hear that part, right. It but, could be you know, the developer yeah. could be in a cash flow crunch right now. He's counting on the money to come in from lot four. And by obstructing that, we are exacerbating his problem. So, you know, I guess I didn't start out here, but I, at the moment I'm feeling like, fine, let's switch to lot two and see how the cards play. Mr. Reedy, uh, you appear before this board a lot and your credibility will take a hit if you don't come through on this. Absolutely. So I would um, expect it to. So that's my comments for the moment. Right. Thank you, Doug. Uh, David, then Janet. Yeah, I, actually, I, I think I pretty much echo Doug's, um, Doug's thoughts. Um, I'd be comfortable with, at this point, switching the um, restriction from lot four to lot two. Uh, I'd like Mr. We'd like, I'd like to set a date for Mr. Reedy to come back with uh, um, some, some more answers about on an estimate and time frame for completion. Um, and I think, that, I think that would be adequate for me. I'd be comfortable with that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Janet and then Jack. So, um, very quickly to Doug, yes, we do care because we, the subdivision control law has us caring about making sure subdivisions have safe roads. Um, I do not want to put anybody in a financial bond and bind and um, um, you know mess up the closing. My idea may be to create a continuing a little bit of motivation on the um, developer's part is why don't we switch it from lot four to seven? We know Seven has got an offer on it. it he'll want to build a house on it. And if we use Lot Seven, um, that will make sure that, you know, he'll come in with his information and his bond, information about bonds, and we can sort of figure out the schedule and where to go from there. That's just an idea. I mean, I, the fallback would be Lot Two. That would be okay with me. But, you know, we are in these, you know, awkward situations, but they're, they're the board, it's not the board's making that we're in this situation. And so I think. Um, I mean, I feel the pressure of the deal and the need to go forward, but I also feel the pressure of making sure we're covered and we're making the right decision. So I, maybe we'll switch lot four for lot seven. We'll figure something out in the next month or so. And that gives the um, developer motivation since he has a, a sale going on on lot seven to figure something else out. There's an offer on lot seven. It's too late to do that. Is it? I think so. Yeah, I would say so. Okay. Or Tom is. I mean, I think it might. Um, I don't know where it's at technically, so I don't know if all of a sudden it's going to be a new encumbrance on the title that's going to throw things out of out of whack. But it hasn't so, closed. It's just correct. Like no, it is not closed. It is not that's closed. Why number certain... four got built on David and you know just encounter what Janet's saying? I just find it intriguing to go with that route because my whole fear has always been that route that lot two is not going to be desirable or it won't sell and then why it just hangs but again I'm, I'm i'm hearing i agree with doug and them if it's not going to go to be a public road the burden will end up falling on the the people who have bought home, spent a lot of money and are having these homes built to live there um i'm going to go to um jack and then michael Yes. Um, do we care? <laughs> Doug's quote. I love that. And Christine uh, also echoed that. 
I mean, they had a subdivision, you know, all subdivisions are speculative, but um, it so happens that the potential buyers there saw, you know, lot four is more uh, appealing. I'm, I'm sure that lot two will be sold, but this seems like a, a minor decision with regard to development of the lot and, you know, the holding of the one lot for the, uh, for the reasons, where are we holding this lot? <laughs> but anyway, I just feel it's arbitrary, but I'm fine with it. I mean, I'm sure lot two is gonna be developed soon enough. And uh, I just feel like it's a non-issue for me anyway. And Michael? Yeah, I, I would uh, like to, I, I, I care, actually. Um, and I would like to support Janet's notion that we switch out lot four, two for lot seven. Uh, it seems to me that lot seven carries with it a greater potential for in hurrying up the process than does lot two. Uh, lot two strikes me as being easily the last lot to, to be built on there. Uh, and as a kind of sidebar, uh, the, de the developer is building the houses prior to selling the lots. Am I correct, Tom? Yeah, so he'll have, he has them under contract and so each of them are built to suit. So he is building each of these houses specifically for the folks that are buying them. These aren't spec houses, to put it another way. So lot four was contracted for prior yeah. to the building beginning. Correct. It, the, the, it, okay, it changed hands. Well, then I, I think then I'm cl clear that we really need to go to lot seven and, and, and put the covenant on that. Because what I'll say is, I'm, I mean, if that gets it done, I, I mean, I'll be back regardless in whenever you tell me to come back um, and hopefully we'll get that one released. But I, I, I mean, I think that's fine. It hasn't been conveyed yet. I can just, I don't know that I've seen a purchase and sale on that. I don't know that our office has done one of those yet. So I don't know that we've got to the point of having to let the other side know. I think it's going to have to be an encumbrance that is taken care of. I think it does give the planning board um, a bit more leverage to say, hurry up and get this done. Um, I think we were going to do it anyway. So that's why I don't, I don't have a problem doing it. I mean, if that, if that gets us to yes tonight and it frees up lot four, I'm fine with that. And, I, and but I do want to know that the board is a little bit more of a developer than they might think given this little horse trading that's gone on. Well, I, yeah, I don't, I don't dispute that. Uh, at all. Uh, my concern is simply that the road gets built to, totally. the, standard, to the standards that the residents who, who, who are going to be living there deserve and that the side road to the parking lot gets built in a sat way that is satisfactory to the town. Uh, and I think both of those need to be, uh, must be, con the, the, uh, the, bond, the bond or the surety has to, con has to cover, cover both of those. Uh, and uh, that's all I have to say. And I think we should try to, I, I would suggest, maybe I should move that we um, allow a, an exchange of the covenant on lot four for a similar covenant on lot seven. Um, and is there more that needs to be said relative to that motion? I think that's all they were asking for. It just says- Yeah, I'll have to update the certificate of performance to release lot four, but then I had provided, however, that lot two shall be subject. So we just have to, and Ms. Brestrup can do it, can cross it out and put that, or I can give her a new one tomorrow. That lot seven shall be subject to the above identified approval with covenant contract. So I don't know if you have it in front of you, but that's the only change that needs yeah. to be made. Okay, well, I, I so move that. Michael has moved and put a motion out there. Does anyone want to second it? Second. Second. Okay, so now we open up to discussion. I see Jack's hand. Oh, uh, I'm just gonna say like, uh, why, lights, why lot seven? I mean, 
it's not our property. It's the developer's, you know, best intuition in terms of what's going to, you know, be best for that development. Uh, I would be remiss to, you know, recommend a different lot than they've come forward to us. Doesn't make sense. So I'm not, I'm not on, you know, on board with switching it. Um, are there any other board members that feel either way on this motion that is currently on the table? Um, I'm going to skip over you for a moment, Michael, because you made the motion. So I'm going to David and then Chris has got her hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, Mr. Reedy said that he'd, he'd, he'd be willing to uh, accept that switch and uh, that that so there there is there is and then and then come back again to speak to us more specifically. I think that that's um, on the table, and I'd be comfortable. I'll be comfortable with that to support the motion and to move things forward for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And Chris, do you have something to um, guide us on? Oh, I didn't, don't have anything to guide you on. I just wanted to see that it sounded to me like Mr. Reedy was um, offering this as a solution for tonight's issue, that lot seven would be substituted for lot four. It didn't sound like he was being, um, well, it, it, it sounded like that's what he was offering right now to me. So Chris, how would this play out? It switches to seven and then eventually they could have the same problem happening like what's happening in four. They're going to get close to a closing. So this is forcing them. And then it would come back to the board again to change from seven to two. That's Unless right. something else comes up like a bond or another solution. But we also will be getting mm -hmm. information from the town engineer. We'll be getting more information from Jason about the work that needs to be done. Yes. And I, I guess I would ask to be on a, an agenda at a date certain so that we can keep the town engineer on it and I can tell my client this is the date this is what I've said I'm going to do so that I'm back before you and I keep my credibility and you, and we just get to the point that I think you're trying to get to tonight I don't have enough information to get you totally there you know and that this is lot seven hopefully just becomes a placeholder mm -hmm. Okay, right. A temper. This is, and it's a more conservative path, is what I'm seeing. I'm, I'm going to recognize Doug and then Michael. Yeah, I was just going to say if that's the solution that gets us through this tonight, I'd be fine with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael? Yeah, just, um, just one last comment. Uh, it's it, it, just a drive through will reveal that lot seven is a more attractive lot than lot two. Um, and therefore is better security. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands up. So we have a motion on the table right now. Um, I assume we're ready to take a vote. Um, I'm still seeing no hands. So I'll do a roll call. Um, for uh, Do we need to say the motion again? It's basically Please. what we're looking at, except um, would be substituting lot seven um, for lot four in this, what it's actually the Apple Brook cluster subdivision, also known as the Hartwell Farm cluster subdivision. Um, so Michael Burt Whistle. Wait, 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 excuse oh, me, yeah. Christine, but, but the motion is also, and that Mr. Reedy will return to the okay. planning board on, and now we need a date to address okay. the, the, the I, I think that that's what we're, talking about. So is that later in August or is that the 5th? Mr. Reedy, sorry. I mean, I would, I don't know what the town engineer's schedule is. I mean, that's what I would like to have. So if you want to do the second meeting in August, I think my client was looking to pave in the fall um, mm -hmm. because he thought lot five would be done by then. So I think the second August meeting might be the best unless you see mm -hmm. something coming on that would be conflicting. Um, but I think that would be the best. And that would be August 19th. Goodbye me if it's okay by everybody here. Mm -hmm. And Chris, does that sound good to you? It's fine. Yeah. Okay. August 19th. All right. So that is also added on that um, Mr. Reedy will be coming back 
and we um, are with a plan. What is what is he coming back for? With a plan for either the switching out for seven back to two or something else, if that's what is determined to be the best. Way. A cost, a cost estimate, or so uh, an identification of what remains to be done, a cost estimate of what remains to be done is verified by Jason Skeels, a time frame of that to be done, and then we'll, in the interim, investigate a bond and see if, you know, depending upon the answers to one and two, that may be the solution to get seven out and the bond there. Good, good. And then that will be kind of firm and all this hopefully will be the last we see of this lovely subdivision. You've got okay, it. Are we clear on the motion? <laughs> are we clear on the motion? No. Uh, okay. I, the motion is to substitute in the original request lot seven for lot two, not yeah. lot seven for lot four. The, no, the seven, it's instead of switching out lot four, instead of switching it to two, will now be seven. Yes. yes. I think you're both saying Wait, the same thing. That's not the way you stated it earlier. Oh. I think we all, you know, what time is it? Yeah, not, okay. It's early, it's early for you. Just, we need to make clear what we're doing. That's yes. all. Well, you know, as long as Chris and Pam have it down. Have it. Yep. Yep, okay. she's got it. I see mm -hmm. a thumb okay. in the dark okay. there. Okay, sorry. Okay, so as long as you all know what you're voting on, that's what's really important. So mm -hmm. I'll do a roll call. Does anyone need to have the motion read to them again? No. No, everyone's good. All right, Michael Burt Whistle. Yes. Maria Chow. Yes. Jack Jemsick. Yes, but I, 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 I'm like cautious about like the developer. Is yes, a, no, it, Jack. What's Jack, that? You're standing yes, no. in a field full of sunflowers. This is not the time for a speech. It's a vote. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> David Levenstein. Yes. Doug Marshall. Yes. Janet McGowan. Aye. And Christine Grimmel and myself, aye, affirmative. So that's um, seven zero zero. Thank you for your work on this and patience. I appreciate it. Good luck on your closing. Thank you. Just to let everybody know, Mr. Reedy is going to come back to me with a revised um, certificate of performance. And then I will ask you all to come in and sign it. And so I'll be uh, making arrangements to meet you in the parking lot, either in front or in back of town hall in the next few days. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. You're welcome. Have fun. Good night. <laughs> all right. Um, five new business item B topics, not anticipated 48 hours. Anything, Chris? I don't think so. Nope. Oh, good. You had me nervous there for a second. Okay. Um, six, Form A, ANR subdivision applications? None. Seven, upcoming ZBA applications? Miss Field Sadler, are there any upcoming ZBA applications? I don't think that there's any that we haven't told you about. They've been working. Um, really hard on the comprehensive permit for 132 Northampton Road. Mm -hmm. That's been their focus. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, eight upcoming SPP, SPR, SUBs application. Nope. Head now. Um, nine, planning board committee and liaison reports. Um, I do have a couple things to say about the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and then I'll ask Jack if he has a report. One is that we need to vote tonight to, well, if he's willing. Though, as we've said, Jack is now on the executive committee too, so he probably wants to be on both. Um, we have to revote him. And uh, today, Chris, I did notice I got an email. You probably did too, Jack. Um, their annual report came out, an email. So I assume that should go to all planning board members and town council because they said they want to know what PVPC is doing. Can you forward that to me? I didn't see that uh, in my email today. I will forward that to you. Okay. So, Jack, to you, our PVPC person, and then we'll take a vote. Do you still want to be on it? No, I. I, I... I, I had, uh, I was approached, you know, like when, um, you know, a year ago, um, 
before um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, I'm forgetting his name, sorry. <laughs> but anyway. I know, our brains are starting to go. Bzz, bzz. Yeah, so my, my brain's you know, starting to go, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, they, they, they approached me that maybe they would you know, want to have me on the executive committee. And, and then, you know, it happened. And um, so I'm on, you know, I'm, I'm with folks that have been with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for a number of years. And then, you know, so the, there's a little segue here with regard to our tenure as planning board members and what, what is, what is, you know, what is the best uh, uh, choice for folks to be on planning board in the, this arbitrary six year uh, limit, uh, you know, led to the, you know, uh, dismissal of, of Greg Stutzman. Um, so it's, you know, a little bit, so there, there's a larger picture here. But anyway, they, they, they put me on this executive committee and I'm not going to be, you know, Amherst is not going to be representative if I'm not going to be on the planning board. So uh, it brings a lot of things up for me. I really like the, you know, Piner Valley Planning Commission and their mission, you know, their mission in general for our, uh, our uh, region and our town. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm saying that I'm excited about being on the executive committee, uh, you know, for the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Uh, and, but again, it kind of, dovetails with our term limits that have come up to play with um, where we've seen the dismissal of, of some of our long longer standing members. But I think I still believe that experience counts for a lot, you know, on the planning board. That's very important. I mean, I, I see, you know, like Doug Marshall came on, but, you know, he, you know, he had like the perfect <laughs> uh, experience. He was able, you know, from day one to contribute. But um, a lot of, you know, a lot of us that it, it, it takes a while to kind of, you know, get our feet wet and understand what how planning board works. Um, but anyway, all I'm saying at this point, with that said, is that yes, I would like to be reappointed as commissioner and represent the town of Amherst uh, in a little bit higher level than we have been in the past uh, as being an executive uh, you know, committee member. Well, I nominate Jack. Someone want a second? Second. Um, any discussion or comments? Was that Michael who seconded? Yes, yeah. it was. Thank you. Um, if there's no discussion, no hands, I'll take a roll call vote. Um, Michael Burtwistle? Yes. Maria Chow? Yes. Jack Jemsick? Yes. yes. I know, it's the weirdest thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Doug Marshall? Hi. Janet McGowan? Yes. <laughs> I'm Christine Grimullen, yes. So that's unanimous seven. Congratulations, Jack. Keep Thank you. Um, are there any other committee or liaison reports? And you can just speak out. That's only, you know, Michael or I don't know, David, did I have the Ag Commission met or anything? No. Okay. And Nothing for me. Okay. All right. So, um, report of chair. I just want to say I'm really glad we don't have a July 29th meeting. <laughs> So um, that made tonight a little more palatable, um, and I'll see you on the 5th, um, and thank you all for working so hard. Uh, now, uh, item 11, report of staff. Well, um, I am sad to say that David Levenstein oh, is no, you don't have to going do off the board as of the 30th of July, and I'm really going to miss David. He's been a 
great addition to the planning board and I've enjoyed working with him. So um, I'm sorry that he's leaving, but I wish him good luck in whatever he does after this. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. I've learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Appreciate you, David. It was a pleasure working with you, Chris and Pam, yeah. <laughs> and all others, but you guys do the heavy lifting. Thank you, David. We'll miss you. We'll see you around town. We will. Not likely during the plague, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's fine. I've seen you with that dog. <laughs> I've seen you with that dog. <laughs> If um, if Chris has nothing else, I can take a motion for adjournment. And it's uh, nine thirty-eight. Wow! Early night for us. Chris. Chris. Yes. Yeah. I believe the week of our second meeting in August is the week I'm on vacation. So you're on vacation on the nineteenth. I believe that it's that week. Yeah. Whether I have Wi-Fi and I want to give up four hours on a Wednesday night, we'll see. Yep. Well, if Tom Brady's on the agenda, you might want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris wanted a movement or a, a motion to adjourn. Sure, I'll give you that. But wait, Doug, are you going to be going to the island so you're not going to need the virtual background? <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty slick, slick trick there, though. Well, I don't know. Right in the back. We'll see. We'll see what I have as an alternative to my current real <laughs> background. <laughs> all right. A second. Someone good? Sure, okay. yeah. Great. All right. All in favor to say aye. Aye. Right. Good night. Good night. Aye. Amherst Media, thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.